<laughs> you know you're being recorded now. <laughs> Clippers one, go Clippers. <laughs> Miss Elvia, I have 7 p.m. Do we have everyone here? Uh, we're checking to see if uh, City Attorney Winder is going to be logging in. Okay, then I will wait for the green light from you then. Yeah. There he is. Okay, as soon as we get Bill on. Made it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bill. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Had <Mayor>. problems. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, good evening and welcome to our regular city council meeting of April 13th, 2021. I will now call the meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. Tonight's public meeting will be conducted utilizing Zoom video communications. This allows the city to conduct our essential business and comply with the public health administration's recommendations to protect the public as well as the city employees while practicing social distancing and limiting exposure and allowing for in-person public meeting. So to ensure that the public will be able to participate tonight, you can make public comments via live comments during the meeting and also email them to public comments at cityofglendora.org. With that, Madam Deputy City Clerk, will you please conduct the roll call? Thank you, Madam Mayor. At this uh, time, I will conduct an oral roll call and request that each council member respond with present when their name is called. Council Member Alawas? Present. Council Member Thompson? Present. Council Member Friedendahl? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer? Present. And Mayor Davis? Present. All council members are present. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight, our invocation will be led by Pastor John Dix of Grace Church of Glendora. And that will be followed by our Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Pastor Dix. Yeah, thank you so much again for the invitation to participate in this meeting. Let's pray together. God, we are very grateful uh, to live in such a great city and an incredible community. We're grateful, God, for the leaders that you have placed over us, uh, men and women uh, who are skilled and talented and gifted in so many different ways. And God, I pray tonight as they um, help us uh, lead our community um, out of a, a really tough season uh, into a new season, God, I pray that you would just really give them wisdom. And I pray that they would see uh, all the different angles of all the different issues and that you would uh, give them discernment to know what is best and what is healthy and what is safe and what will uh, benefit this great city that we live in. So thank you for each one of them for the gifts that you have given them, the skills, the talents, the resources. And God, I too thank you, not just for the uh, the members of the council, but our, entity, our entire uh, city leadership team. Uh, we are grateful for each and every one of them uh, and the job that they do to protect us and to keep us safe and to create an environment, God, where we can flourish and we can love our neighbor and we can um, show them just how deeply uh, you love each and every one as well. 
So Holy Spirit, would you guide this meeting and uh, walk in front and behind and around every decision that is made? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, if you are able, please stand and join me in the pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the, Republic. to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Dix, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Tonight, you, the audience may notice that we are operating by a different order of our agenda. A few months ago, the council discussed and voted on a new format for our meetings. And tonight is the first night that we are using this new format. So those of you tuning in may be aware of the difference tonight as well. This takes us now to our student reports, which we have none and then to our reordering of and additions to the agenda. Does anyone have anything to reorder or any additions to the agenda? No. Oh. No. Okay, thank you. Seeing none, then that takes us to public comment time. I invite members of the public to address the city council. Speakers are limited to three minutes, speaking once on both items on and off of the agenda and public comment time is limited to 30 minutes. If you wish to speak, you could select the raise hand icon in Zoom, and or also you may um, submit your comments via email as mentioned before. And at this time, I uh, ask Madam Deputy City Clerk, are there any public comments that we've received? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. At this time, no requests were received, public comments via email um, or request during the Zoom meeting to speak during public comment period. Okay. If there are no public comments, then I close the public comment time. And that takes us to member statements and reports. Council Member Alawas. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just have one thing. I'd like to uh, uh, I'd like to thank Jackie Dornick, uh, uh, our appointee to the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District, for her efforts in managing and reporting on our mosquitoes and black fly issues here in Glendora. Uh, this is the first time that I've ever um, can remember that we've actually had a monthly report on their spraying. Uh, so, for those of folks that aren't familiar with the black flies, more so in the foothill communities. We have um, a big infestation of black flies, particularly in the summertime when it gets warm, and they usually take care of it in the upper uh, rivers up here at San Gabriel Valley. Do we have that uh, picture of the, there it is. So I've never seen one of these before, at least I can remember, which is nice. It's a monthly report on their spraying efforts to control the mosquitoes and the black flies in the area, which is uh, quite handy and she's really on it. And uh, I really uh, appreciate and thank her efforts for doing so. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Friedendahl. Uh, only would like to report and, and invite the city to take advantage of our upcoming Earth Day that the Community Services Department is sponsoring on April 24th. The drive-by event at the Youth Center with lots of fun things to do. So take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Thompson. Mayor, thank you. I'd like to uh, just remind and celebrate the fact that our schools are open. And so there's a lot of kids that are out and uh, it's been a while since they've been going to school, walking to school and riding bikes. So I would encourage all of us to slow down and be, be aware of the fact that kids are out and, uh, and kids are kids. So we need to take care of, of them. I uh, want to make sure that uh, everybody knows that our goal line is continuing to move. Uh, good things are occurring there. Uh, I was on a budget call a week ago and pleased to let everyone know that the budget is, uh, is uh, right on. Uh, in fact, we're under a little bit uh, and uh, we anticipate getting done a little bit sooner than what we thought. So we hope that that trend just continues to go on. 
And uh, if you're wanting to know anything about what's going on, I would encourage you to go to the, to the Goal Line website and uh, and make a, a you know take, just take a look there. The last thing that I would like to ask the staff for is an update on our passport initiative. Uh, with summer coming up and travel looking like it's going to be more than it has been. Uh, I would certainly like to hear how all that's going and how we might better serve those that are uh, needing pass passports. And Adam, uh, you and I have talked about this. So if possible, if we could have some sort of an update by uh, April the 27th, then I would appreciate that. Uh, if not, we can have it first part of May, but I'll just leave that up to you know you and uh, but with that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Um, thanks, Karen. Just uh, you know, a couple of things. First, I want to give kudos. Um, last Saturday, we had our first uh, trails cleanup day or trails day after uh, having to cancel a couple of them due to the pandemic. We had uh, well over 50 people show up to come and help uh, clean the trails. And it was pretty interesting because there was people not just from Glendora, from other areas as well that came out to, um, to, to help with the trail cleanup because they utilize our trails as well. So great job to everybody involved in that. And then just a couple of updates, um, you know, and uh, I, I represent the city on a couple of water committees. And, you know, when it comes to water, we're starting to hear the rustling of um, drought conditions again. Uh, we've had two years of less than normal rain and some of the things and, and the governor is actually being urged to try to declare a state of emergency, which would require us to go back to the drought conditions and some of the restrictions we had before. Um, the snow packs and the Colorado River water is only at about 70% of where it normally is. And we're not seeing as much down here, but the Central and Imperial Valleys are where most of the issues are taking place. And that's where most of our agriculture has grown for the state. So we just really need for all of us to conserve as much as we can. And maybe we can avoid, avoid going back to mandatory conservation uh, restrictions. Um, also, I had an opportunity to see a presentation from uh, one of the committee members involved in the redistricting efforts in California. And it was really a great presentation. And, and the one thing that I took away from that is how they're really looking for feedback from uh, individuals. And so we all have an opportunity to go to the website and actually share some of your thoughts and, and ideas. I look at here in Glendora, our, we're unfortunately split in half in two congressional districts. And um, so that's the kind of a thing that if, if that's an issue for you, you may want to reach out and let these guys know, but um, you can share your opinions at a website, www.wedrawthelinesca.org. Um, and there actually is an opportunity in there to give your opinions of where the map line should be. And that's a separate website. It's www.drawmycacommunity.org. So if you just Google these sites, you'll be able to find them. You don't need to uh, remember what they are, um, but it, it would be a good idea if, if you want to give your feedback to get on there and, and share your comments. That's it. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And yes, it was a great turnout Saturday for Trails Day. Very impressive. And thanks to Rotary for providing refreshments. Uh, tonight, I would like to ask that we adjourn our meeting in memory of Jerry Bergen. Jerry died March 29th after suffering a stroke. Jerry was a musician, singer, songwriter, folk historian, and author who first became known as a member of We Five, the Grammy-nominated 60s folk rock group that he co-founded. The group's hit recording, You Were On My Mind, set a standard for vocal innovation and was number four on Billboard's Top 100 Songs of 65. Jerry has been a mentor to many people in the music field, both locally and nationally, and was well known in music circles in the community. He and his wife, Debbie, have been very generous with their time and talents, performing at many community events, including library volunteer luncheons, 
the 9-11 Remembrance Service, National Day of Prayer, as well as being worship leaders at First Baptist Church. His talent and compassion will be missed, but his legacy of music and kindness will live on. So I ask that tonight we adjourn in memory of Jerry Bergen. With that, now I turn to city manager and city attorney statements, Mr. Raymond. Good evening, Mayor. Just a quick reminder, the Glendora report should be heading out in the next two weeks here. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, my only comment is we continue to monitor the plethora of housing bills that uh, keep cropping up before the legislature. Uh, there is a troubling trend in California to uh, to remove local control over important housing decisions, and we'll keep the council and staff briefed on that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate that. That takes us now to special items. Our first special item tonight is a police department quarterly update, so I invite Chief Matt Egan to give us an update. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief um, because we have a, a really uh, thick agenda this evening. Uh, but I'm going to touch on four main topics uh, for council briefing and for community awareness. Uh, first item that we're going to talk about would be the community dashboard. Then I will move into RIPA and describe what that is, which is the Racial um, and Profiling Act. And then a quick personnel update and then a list of upcoming events so that uh, community uh, members are aware. Uh, next slide, please. So first off is our community dashboard. Um, the community dashboard is a community-based uh, access portal of access through the City of Glendora website. You uh, navigate to departments, then police, then crime mapping. The community dashboard um, generates data from various different sources. I'm gonna show you some examples of where that data is generated from, uh, what that mapping looks like, how to manipulate the dashboard and uh, particular preferences based on what you're looking for or what you might be interested in. Next slide, please. First is a screen grab of what the splash page um, after you click on the crime mapping uh, tab on our police department website, what this looks like. Uh, next slide. In the top left corner, you'll see um, crime charts, crime mapping. You'll see natures, incidents, and circumstances. Top right corner, and I apologize, these are really small, um, but I wanted to capture the entire screen, screen. This is what you'll see when you navigate to the site. Top right is a pull down screen, which a uh, pull down tab, which has a selector between seven, 14, and 30 days. So what we've done in the last few months is we've worked with the vendor that collects the data from our uh, CAD or computer aided dispatch system. Um, particular calls generated by community members and observations by officers um, based on what's presented over the telephone or what's presented over the radio uh, generates a nature, a call type, or a circumstance. Next slide, please. Each one of these natures, these incidents, these circumstances fall into a set of domains. Now we've limited the domains, there's quite a few, but we've limited them to this comprehensive list. Uh, we've um, intentionally left out um, sexual-based uh, uh, offenses, also child abuse investigations, elder abuse investigations, uh, attempted homicide and homicides. Um, luckily, those don't happen very often in Glendora. So uh, tab number one, incidents, that's aggravated assault, commercial burglary, fraud, motor vehicle theft, residential burglary, retail theft, which is theft from a retail store like Home Depot or Walmart, robbery, and then there's robbery strong arm, which is uh, you know grabbing something from someone, general theft and then theft from a vehicle. We wanted to split those out because theft from vehicles is a very different, um, a very different uh, nature code or incident that we track. And then finally vandalism. Circumstances tab will track all homeless contacts. Homeless are split up into three different areas. Um, homeless no report, um, homeless uh, arrest, and homeless report but no, um, uh, no follow-up needed. And then finally, natures, and these are alcohol and drug offenses, animal calls. We wanted to throw um, those onto the system so that people could see where 
animal uh, related incidents are occurring. Assist other jurisdictions is when we help our partners either to the east, to the west, or to the south, um, and sometimes to the north with CHP and Sheriff's Department. Disturbances, so, and we've split out disturbances from party calls to disturbance of person. So a person causing a disturbance, either in a street store or in a home versus a, um, a party. DUIs, medical assists. Uh, medical assists uh, are an important uh, tracking function because as first responders, we work very closely with our LA County Fire Department peers. And so it's important to, to see the, the number of activities that we have traced to that. Municipal code violations, traffic accidents. Traffic accidents are split up into three different categories, accident, accident hit and run, and accident with injuries. And then finally, uh, vandalism with graffiti. And then we, our, our last one is fireworks. And then, like I said before, we have a date range that we've expanded from seven days originally. Now we're doing a seven day, a 14 day, or a 30 day. So you can do data sets based on any one of those natures. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. And when you click on uh, the map of the mapping function, um, this is what you'll see. So you'll see um, it'll, it populates using Google Maps. You'll have to uh, use your keyboard to scroll in and out. You can do a hybrid or uh, a terrain view so you can see real world you know, houses and buildings, or you can just do a street map like this. Next slide, please. On the left, you'll see that there's a list of tabs um, with all of the things that I just discussed, all of the natures, incidents, and circumstances. As you scroll your mouse over each one of those, you can select or deselect. You can select them all, or you can select just the ones you're looking for. As you do that, it'll populate instantly on the map. Um, on the right is where you can select whether you're looking for a seven day look back, a 14 day look back, or a 30 day look back. Um, each one of these incidents uh, that um, is on the map uh, does have a clearance code. It'll, it'll tell you, um, you know, ARR, which is an arrest, or CRT, which is cited, report taken. There's a, we've included now a ledger on the splash page for the city, depart, uh, city police department website so that everybody can refer back to that if they have questions. Um, and the whole point of this is to uh, be uh, more transparent, to, um, to, to really showcase our efforts in the community, um, both addressing calls, um, uh, tracking data, and being responsive to our community. So we, uh, we invite everyone to utilize that. Um, I do have to give you a disclaimer. Um, it's a data-driven uh, machine, so it draws from um, our CAD system uh, once every 24 hours, and so there is a slight delay. Um, we're working at adjusting the delay hours. Um, and a lot of the questions we've had in the past is, um, can we just throw everything in there? And the answer is yes, and we can make it for all time, you know, uh, one year, two year, and three years. The problem with that is that it takes a lot of uh, data grinding behind the scenes for this program to aggregate that data, to go out into the system and grab what you're looking for, collate it, and then map it. And we found that uh, the downtime results in user um, uh, disappointment. You know, they're saying it takes too long, it doesn't work right and such. Uh, we tested it for the last three or four months with various uh, sources and we've settled on this as being the quickest and most responsive. So uh, invite everybody to play with it and see what they like. Um, we are still manipulating it. It's a work in progress, but very happy with where we're at with, with it at this point. Next slide. Uh, next topic is RIPA, which is the Racial and Identity Profiling Act. Uh, this profiling act was uh, as a result of Assembly Bill 953 um, from Assembly Member Weber, um, written in 2016. Uh, this went into effect in 18, and it started to require all law enforcement agencies in the state of California, starting with the eighth, eighth largest agencies, to begin collecting stop data and reporting that information to the Department of Justice in California. Uh, the bill requires that each state and local agency employ peace who employs police officers to send this report annually to the attorney general. And this is data on all stops. And I'm going to go over that data and what that looks like. Next slide, please. Um, so in order for all of the agencies, since there's really big agencies like L.A. County Sheriff's Department, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department, LAPD, all the big ones, everyone knows those. 
the bill required those agencies of a thousand or more peace officer to begin sending those reports back in 2019. And as you can see from the four bullet points, um, the numbers go down. We fall in the last category. So we are an agency that employs uh, one or more, but less than 334 peace officers. And so thereby we are required to submit our first annual report, April 1st of 2023. Um, that actually means it has to be in, but that doesn't, there's some testing and some other data transmission work that begins uh, by the end of, um, for the very beginning of 2022. So we begin working on it already. Next slide, please. So what does it look like and what's the data set? So this is it. This is the 16 things that are required for every traffic stop, every pedestrian check, every call for service, uh, every interaction between a police officer and a community member. Uh, beginning at the end of this year. So uh, ORI number is our agency specific number, date and time duration of the stop, location of the stop, perceived race or ethnicity of person stopped, perceived gender of the person stopped, person perceived to be LBGT, or I'm sorry, LGBT, I had that backwards, perceived age of the person stopped, uh, person has limited or no English fluency, perceived or known disability, or of the person stopped. The reason for the stop was the stop made in response to a call for service, the actions taken by the officer, the results of the stops, the officer's ID number, the number of years that officer has been a police officer and the type of assignment that officer is assigned. So next slide, please. So you can imagine that your basic traffic stop, we're working a stop sign, uh, somebody runs that stop sign, we make that traffic stop, we, we write that violator a citation for uh, the stop sign violation. And after the person is released from that traffic stop, which takes anywhere from three to five minutes, depending on how long it takes people to find their information and, and the officer to uh, write that citation and hand it over to the violator. Now the officer has to sit uh, for about seven to 10 minutes and do this data completion for every, um, for every stop. Um, nothing we can do about this. This is a state mandate. It's law. Um, we've talked with our, our friends and peers in larger agencies to vet out. Um, luckily, they've had a chance to run it through the system and try to figure out what works and doesn't work. Uh, what we found is that um, the staff time to build the infrastructure behind the scenes to capture that data is going to take about three to six months. We've already started it. And our vendor, which is Spillman, they're the ones that run our CAD system. It's a uh, computer software company that you've heard me speak of before. It generates the information on the community dashboard. It's our records management system. It's, it's an it's a integral part of our police operations. Uh, that vendor has taken the information request um, since they've partnered with a lot of agencies in California and they're building us a portal um, which will automize, automate and um, itemize a lot of these um, statistical data that's required. And we're hoping to cut down uh, that that data entry time for every traffic stop. So it's a new, uh, it's a new thing that we'll have to uh, endeavor into. It's an unfunded mandate, um, uh, but we will can be compliant. We will have our data, first data transfer done by January 1st of 2022. So um, excited to look to forward to seeing what that looks like and then helping the officers um, get through that so that we can be legislatively in, um, in the green zone, so to speak. So uh, next slide, please. Quick, quick uh, snapshot since the December update when I came to council and talked about vacancies and hiring. Um, uh, we've hired two police officers. These are laterals, uh, don't need academy experience. They're out on the road working, one's working tonight. Um, we've hired four police officer trainees. Those trainees are in the academy. They're currently at San Bernardino County Sheriff's Academy. This is their th third week in the academy. And we've also uh, successfully hired two part-time community service officers. Presently, our vacancies, we're down to on the books, um, functional vacancies, we're down to three police officers. And we're still currently testing both lateral and entry level, looking for good qualified candidates to be good uh, police officers, good representatives of our city. And uh, current vacancies for police service representatives are public safety dispatchers. It's kind of a momentous week this week. We'll have a, that'll be a pocket proclamation coming up. We still have one vacancy in there. So we're actively searching for police service representative candidates to fill that vacancy as well. Next slide, please. 
quick look at uh, at the month and uh, months ahead. Um, we have a catalytic converter etching event coming out on the same day as Earth Day. We partnered with uh, um, our public works friends at the city of Glendora, and we are hosting our own catalytic uh, converter etching event. This will be hosted at the Glendora Street Yard on Lorraine. We're gonna have a social media push uh, very quickly um, in the next couple of weeks to talk about what it looks like and there'll be a sign up list. Uh, this is not a drop in event for those of you community members um, on the call listening in. You must uh, sign up with us and there are waivers and agreements but the goal is to etch your license plate or your VIN number on your catalytic converter um, in the event that your catalytic converter gets stolen while you're either at home or at work or away or somewhere. And it is found by an, a law enforcement agency uh, with your license plate and your VIN number attached to it. Um, the odds increase on it coming back to you. And with the average cost of a catalytic converter um, anywhere from $800 to $2,400, uh, it's a pretty valuable, inexpensive way to um, hopefully aid in the recovery of something that's stolen from you. Um, hopefully with a good social media push too, it'll uh, make uh, the thieves in our community think twice about uh, coming into our community to steal more. This week, as you are aware, is the Dispatcher Appreciation Week. Uh, after my presentation and during the uh, proclamation for uh, dispatchers, I'm going to pop into dispatch and, and uh, be in the room when the uh, when the presentation is made so that you can see the room, see the working dispatchers and hear from somebody on duty right now. It's going to be really fun. Uh, our homeless outreach services team, better known as host, resumed this week, um, as well as our mental health evaluation team. So that's met. Uh, the clinician due to COVID and the host team due to COVID with the partners with LA County Department of Mental Health and, um, and LASA. Um, we're on hiatus, but we're back up and running. So you'll see teams out there addressing homelessness and offering services and MET is available should anybody need them. The week of May 3rd is the Correctional or the Jailer Appreciation Week. Remember that May 10th is the National Police Week with uh, Peace Officers Memorial Day worked into that week. Uh, DUI checkpoint planned for May. Uh, more information to come about uh, that. That is a Office of Traffic Safety grant uh, um, meant to curb uh, impaired and intoxicated driving. It's a community outreach event uh, where we hope to educate um, the driving um, public. And um, sometimes we do catch violators. And then do not forget that June 9th is Louis Pompey Memorial. Uh, we'll have some type of uh, remembrance ceremony. Uh, hopefully we'll have uh, some more clear guidance um, from the presenter coming up next, Mr. Adam Raymond, who will talk about COVID and such. So next slide, please. Just wanna say thank you to council uh, for inviting me and I'm happy to uh, share this information. I look forward to the next update. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that update and all that information. Uh, next is our COVID-19 reopening the economy update. So Mr. Adam Raymond, take it away. Good evening, everyone again. Next slide, Elvia. This is our reoccurring COVID update. This is our 20th update. Uh, the 19 previous council updates build on one another, talking about the changes from that point in time. Next slide, please. As we are all familiar with, uh, since August of 2020, the state's been in a tiered opening system. Uh, each color represents a different tier with different reopening allowances. Um, during the reopening process, an emergency break was pulled in late 2020, um, and we implemented a regional approach, which is based on ICU availability. Next slide, Elvia. As we emerged from that regional approach and went back to a safer blueprint, we've made pretty rapid progress since January with LA County transitioning from the purple to the red tier in March and recently since our last meeting from the red to the orange tier in early April of 2021. Next slide, please. As a quick reminder, as the state's gone through its reopening protocols, it's changed the, the factors in which we view our reopening. Currently, we've reached a goal, goal two with 4 million vaccine doses administered to higher at-risk populations for the city uh, or for the county of Los Angeles and therefore the city of Glendora to move to the most le least restri restrictive tier. 
we have to be under two cases per 100,000 residents. Next slide, please. As of this morning, uh, with the recent updates, this is where we're at. As, as you'll know, Los Angeles, uh, really all of our surrounding counties through Orange and Riverside are about the same. Um, the city of Los Angeles has continued to do a great job with its most at-risk populations um, with a less than 2% positivity. Uh, we qualify to go to the yellow tier if it was not for the new cases per day. Uh, over the past week, that adjusted tier of 3.2 cases per 100,000 actually ticked up slightly from 3.1, but remaining pretty stable as are all counties. The only county that's a little higher than the others is, this, is the county of San Diego. Next slide, please. So here's a quick map, uh, pretty remarkable. If you go back three council meetings, you can see how quickly we've transitioned from an all purple map to some red now to mostly orange. Um, there, there, is some, there is one purple county left, um, but the majority of counties, more than 80% of the state's population are in the orange tier. Next slide, please. Last week, we got word from the state of California that on June 15th, the state anticipates moving out of the tiered system. Uh, the information on the slide, a lot of it is verbatim from the state's press release talking about vaccination requirements and potential testing for events. Uh, we don't have any specific guidance and hopefully as we transition and move towards June 15th, we're able to get a much better understanding of what the state means by uh, the items included in this presentation. First and foremost, the June 15th date is predicated on the fact that uh, equitable vaccines will be available and the current rate of infection remains low. Next slide, please. Uh, the state leads out by saying common sense measures such as masking will still be required in the state. Uh, we don't have any details on that. And they also note, as you will see throughout the next few slides, that testing or vaccination verification requirements will remain in certain relevant settings. They haven't necessarily described those settings. Next slide, please. According to the state, uh, all sectors currently listed in the blueprint or current tiered activities at the state of California may return to usual operations. They must be in compliance with the various or any remaining health uh, order uh, requirements that will exist, which will be minimal. As talked about previously, they talk about um, certain masking, testing, and or vaccination requirements for large scale or higher risk events. A little more specificity on the next slide, Elvia. Uh, specifically, um, events will be capped at 5,000 people until October 1st, based on the current state, on the state's current uh, estimated protocols. Um, unless testing or vaccination status verification is implemented by attendees, any international convention will only be allowed if fully vaccinated and there's verification of all, of all attendees being so. Next slide, please. The state's made a point to say that schools and institutions of higher learning should conduct full-time in-person instruction Additionally, all workplaces, not just essential businesses, um, should try to reduce risk to the extent possible, improving indoor ventilation, requiring masking where appropriate, as well as allowing remote work where possible as long as it doesn't impact business operations. Additionally, the state has said that Californians and travelers into California will be subject to the current California Department of Public Health and CDC travel restrictions, which we will talk about here later on in the presentation. Next slide, please. So there are five areas the state of California has said we will need to monitor from a public health and medical infrastructure perspective as we move to more of a life as we used to know it. Um, this, this continues to mean that there is a robust vaccination opportunity for all residents 16 and older that uh, equity focused monitoring or the most at risk populations still have an equal opportunity to be vaccinated if necessary. Next slide, please. Um, that we continue to contain the spread through the timely investigation, um, that we still have the ability to scale up if necessary and that we monitor uh, hospitals and all of our medical supplies still remain strong. Next slide, please. 
So as we know more details about what the state presented last week and that information in the presentation this evening comes from the press release, we'll definitely pass that along. Uh, we do not know what they mean by vaccine validation or what that looks like. Uh, a little too early to tell, but we will present that information as much as we can when we are. As it relates to the county, um, if you can go back one slide, Elvia, please. The county's reopening uh, largely has mirrored the state of California's this time around. Uh, from late 2020, uh, we had some additional closures. And as we've moved in January and February and March of 2021, we've seen return in schools of school children. We've seen return of youth sports and expanded reopenings consistent with the state's uh, both red tier. Next slide, Elvia and current orange tier. Uh, the current health order was updated uh, April 2nd. It is available on the county's website as well as many updated appendices. Uh, Faith-based organizations, we are anticipating an updated protocol appendice based on this California's uh, announcements uh, that they can return to full indoor activities pretty soon. We don't have a date yet. We have reached out to the county and expect to be provided that information shortly. Elvia, next slide, please. So current reminder of what is currently uh, allowable. And if we look down in the orange tier, outdoor events and live concerts will have capacity of up to 33%. This means our concerts in the park are allowed to return and we are excited to provide that to you. You'll have information in your Glendora report when it comes. And additionally, at theme parks, 25% uh, will be admitted and those are limited to in-state uh, visitors only. Next slide, Elvia. Apologies here, we were trying to take some of the county's uh, protocols and blow them up. In essence, the restaurants in the orange tier were allowed for a indoor capacity of 50% or 200 people, whichever is less. Um, and additionally, they still encourage outdoor dining. Uh, bars, which were previously closed, are allowed with are allowed outdoor only with and some indoor with certain modifications, tables eight feet apart, uh, limited to three households and they're closed for on-site consumption after 10 p.m. Next slide, please. Breweries and wineries, which were outdoor only, have 25% indoor capacity, up to 100 people. Uh, outdoors, we have different uh, protocols on the, the number of people that can be gathered, um, and TV, TV viewing is now permitted outdoors, which was previously banned. Movie theaters currently are allowed indoor capacity at 50% or 200 people per theater. Uh, reserve seating to allow for six feet of distance between groups and eating is only allowed in designated areas. Uh, gyms and fitness centers are indoor capacity at 25% and zoos and museums and aquariums are now allowed at 50% up from 25%. Next slide, Elvia. So we talked earlier about the travel advisory. This slide comes from a recent presentation of the County of Los Angeles, which effectively says that for non-essential business travel, uh, so for pleasure travel, fully vaccinated adults do not need to quarantine. Those that are not fully vaccinated must quarantine for seven days with a negative test or 10 days without. And essentially the CDC, which the state and county adopted those guidelines, always say to monitor after non-essential travel or any travel for potential symptoms and, and get tested if necessary. Next slide, please. Just a quick reminder, the, the city of Glendora, we still get this question from time to time, must follow both the state and county restrictions. If the state sets the ceiling, the county sets the floor. While the city could add a basement, we have not done so to date. Uh, we have actively encouraged the state to allow for a reopening and allow for people to take their own measured risks. Next slide, please. Just a quick recap on city facilities here. Uh, most facilities have returned to normal hours of operation. Uh, the city's open Monday through Thursday, but we are available every day of the week uh, with extended hours for appointments. Um, Councilman Thompson talked earlier about passports. We have been uh, open for passports the entirety of this through appointments. I see Elvia nodding. We have people coming as far as Lancaster. Uh, to get passports, both the county and post office remains closed and we remain open. So uh, John Aguirre's staff here is getting cross-trained from the state, Department of the State to, to help us uh, with the passports and uh, we're excited to continue to provide the expanded services via Zoom and appointment. Next slide, please. 
Vaccinations uh, continue to be in the news quite frequently. Um, effective on 415, everyone 16 and older in LA County is eligible to be vaccinated, which mirrors moves from several states uh, earlier in the federal government. Uh, these are the websites, myturn.ca.gov at the state level or vaccinatelacounty.com at the county level to make appointments, look at eligibility and determine how to get your vaccine if you choose to do so. Next slide, please. As always, we encourage you to visit the city's website. Uh, Greg Morton, who's on the call, always does an amazing job ensuring the most up-to-date information is not only on our website, but, but pressed out via social media. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. I'll be the next slide. And with that, Mayor, turn it back over to you for any questions from the council, if applicable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Uh, anyone have any questions for him? Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Um, yeah. Adam, could you just speak briefly on what the possibility is or uh, the, the chances of us getting back to being in person on a regular basis? That's a great question. Uh, the city managers in the San Gabriel Valley had the chance to talk to Dr. Barbara Ferrer, uh, and really we are all eager to get some updated gathering guidance from the state of California. Uh, as I'm sure everyone knows, state of California issued guidance that said fully vaccinated adults can meet indoors without masks for periods of time. And yet uh, at fully vaccinated adults in an essential business function are currently not able to do so. Uh, we are waiting for that. A lot of cities in the San Gabriel Valley um, there are only a couple that are back in person. Um, wearing face masks at the dais remains a difficult um, issue to both understand and sometimes hear. Uh, a lot of cities are looking, targeting May or June pending additional guidance. So I would say within the next two months, we would expect us to have significant guidance and would be, would be able to do so. Uh, I would just add that uh, the city clerk's office has done a remarkable job and with, with Kathleen and her staff of adding technology updates to the council chambers that if we were able to return and even if the public was not, we would still be allowed to have Zoom meeting, call in and public comment in person, even if all of us were in the council chambers on the on the TV screens that are in there. So, so the mayor pro tem, I would say within the next two months, we should be back in the council chambers. Thanks, appreciate it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Raymond. As always, uh, a lot for you to keep up with, but you do a superb job of keeping up with the ever-changing guidelines. That takes us to our other special items for tonight, proclamations. And as Chief Egan mentioned earlier, this is National Public Safety Telecommunications Week, the week of April 11th through the 17th. And Council Member Friedendahl will read the proclamation. And joining our meeting tonight is PSR Kelly Montez. So Council Member Friedendahl. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's my privilege to recognize the National Public Safety Communications Week and share this proclamation. Whereas public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with the emergency services, they are the vital link between the citizen or victim and the public safety provider who may apprehend a criminal, save their possessions from fire, or save their life or the life of someone else. And whereas each day, public safety telecommunicators answer desperate calls for help, responding with services that save the lives and property of citizens in need of assistance and whereas the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who call the Glendora 911 communication centers. And whereas public safety te telecommunicators of the Glendora Police Department have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals and treatments of patients. And whereas during 2020, Glendora dispatchers handled a total of 38,722 calls for service, with 3,586 being 911 emergency calls. 
The phones in our dispatch center rang a total of 82,183 times during 2020. And whereas Glendora's dispatchers exhibit compassion, understanding and professionalism while performing their job every day of the year. Now, therefore, we the City Council of the City of Glendora do hereby declare the week of April 11 to 17, 2021 as National Public Safety Telecommunications Week in the City of Glendora in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city and residents safe. In witness whereof, Mayor Davis has set her hand and caused the seal of the city of Glendora to be affixed this 13th day of April, 2021. Now on behalf of the telecommunications department, I would like to introduce Ms. Kelly Montez, public service representative for the Glendora Police Department. Kelly? Hello, on behalf of all the dispatchers, we thank you. We're very fortunate to work for a city that cares so much about its employees and citizens. And it was evident even more so this year with all the challenges we faced. We thank you guys again for your support. Hey, Council Member uh, Friendall, I don't know if you could see this. Let me see if I can bring my frame into view. I see it. Okay, so. I would have heard the two of We have a new plaque that we're gonna, or a new poster board and plaque that we're gonna be placing outside our communication center. It says Glendora 911 Dispatch Center. The heroes you never see and they are our, the new first responders. And so we are very grateful to have all of our dispatchers. And we thank you very much for honoring us with this proclamation this evening. Well deserved. Thank you and congratulations to the entire team. Thank you and thank you for taking us live to the center of the universe there, right into the dispatch center. So thank you very much. That takes us to our next proclamation, a proclamation declaring April 4th through the 10th, 2021 as National Library Week and Council Member Alawas will read that into the record. And joining us tonight is Library Board Vice President, Roger Gutierrez. Council Member Alawas. Thank you, Mayor. Whereas libraries have long served as trusted and treasured institutions for all members of the community promoting the free exchange of information and ideas and whereas libraries offer opportunities for everyone to explore new worlds and become their best selves through access to technology, multimedia content and educational programs. And whereas libraries have long served as trusted and treasured institutions and library workers and librarians fuel efforts to better their communities, campuses and schools. And whereas the Glendora Public Library has adapted to a changing world by expanding its resources in order to meet the needs of their patrons, both in person and virtually. And whereas Glendora Public Library and its staff look beyond their traditional roles and provide transformative opportunities for education, employment, entrepreneurship, empowerment, and engagement, as well as new services that connect closely with patrons' needs, and whereas Glendora Public Library opens up a world of possibilities through innovative science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics, programming, job-seeking resources, and the power of reading. Therefore, we, the Glendora City Council, do hereby proclaim the week of April 4th through April 10th, 2021 as National Library Week in the city of Glendora, recognizing that libraries transform lives and communities. In witness hereof, the mayor has hereunto set her hand and caused the seal of the city of Glendora to be affixed this 13th day of April, 2021. I'd like to invite uh, Rod Mr. Roger Gutierrez, Vice President of the Library Board of Trustees to now uh, accept the proclamation on behalf of the library. Roger. Thank you, Council Miles. Uh, yes, I'm very, uh, Honored and privileged to be here to accept this proclamation on behalf of the Library Board of Trustees, representing our President Doris Blum and our fellow trustees, Brian Achu, uh, Tokomo, uh, Tomomo, uh, I'm sorry, Tomoko Nolan, and Robin Weekly. Uh, this has been uh, a, quite a journey in the most recent year, especially during the pandemic times. And uh, the staff has just uh, stepped up 
very impressive, uh, very uh, dedicated and passionate about their services. And it's not uh, how we're going to do it is, is how and why and, uh, and uh, fulfill those, uh, all those needs that were still uh, left unfulfilled. And they have just done an exceptional, jo exceptional job as always, even prior to pandemic times, but especially stepped up during these uh, more challenging times of this recent year. Uh, led by, of course, Director uh, Janet Stone and her exceptional staff. Uh, we're very proud of them and uh, thank all of them for their services and dedication for serving this uh, great community as known as Condor Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, to you and uh, the entire library staff. Uh, you're definitely uh, uh, the glue that holds uh, everything together in our community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Alawas, and thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. That takes us to our next proclamation, uh, proclaiming April 2021 as Donate Life Month. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer will be reading that proclamation. And tonight, uh, to join our meeting is One Legacy Ambassador, Yasmina Raji. So, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. It is my privilege to read this proclamation honoring those who not only give of their organs, but those who are passionate about um, making sure and promote this, this uh, service that we all should participate in. Whereas organ, eye, tissue, marrow, and blood donations are life-giving acts recognized worldwide as expressions of compassion to those in need, and whereas more than 108,000 individuals nationwide and more than 21,000 in California are currently on the National Organ Transplant Waiting List, and on average 17 people die each day waiting for a life-saving transplant. And whereas a single individual's donation of a heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, small intestine can save up to eight lives, and donation of tissue can save and heal the lives of more than 75 others, and a single blood donation can help three people in need. Whereas deceased organ donors saved more than 33,000 lives in 2020, the most ever, and whereas currently there are 17,123,434 Californians who are currently registered as donors, to ensure their wishes are honored to help improve the lives of another. And whereas California residents can sign up to be an organ, eye, and tissue donor when applying for or renewing their driver's license or ID cards at the California DMV, or you can sign up at www.donatelifecalifornia.org. Now, therefore, we, the City Council of the City of Glendora, do hereby proclaim April 2021 as DMV Donate Life Month in the City of Glendora. And in doing so, we encourage all Californians to check yes when applying for or renewing their driver's license or ID cards. In witness whereof, our mayor has hereunto set forth her hand and caused the seal of the City of Glendora to be affixed this 13th day of April, 2021. Yasmina, thank you very much for your service and uh, I'd like to invite you to say a few words. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor and esteemed city council members. I appreciate so very much the city of Glendora where I used to be a past resident for many years issuing Donate Life Month. Your participation spotlights the importance of organ, eye, and tissue donation. It will inspire others to get involved and register, which is absolutely key to lowering these numbers. Again, I'm Yasmina Rauji. I'm a volunteer. After my time educating tissue and eye donation, I became an ambassador as my dad allowed in was an organ donor. You know, as teenagers, we all want to get our driver's license. And I remember my parents sitting me down and saying, you know, it's a privilege, it's not a right. And you need to take this very, very seriously. So my first sort of behind the wheel instruction by my dad, uh, I expressed my desire to be an organ donor myself. 
on my driver's license application. And I remember my dad's expression. It was full of pride, but he had tears in his eyes and he told me he was proud of me. That's what any parent wants to hear from their parents. Uh, so when my dad's driver's license renewed, he too became an organ donor and he shared his news with me. Now I was full of pride. I was going to uh, tell you about the facts, but uh, thank you pro tem mayor, you did a, a better job than I ever could, so thank you. A little bit about my dad, uh, he passed in 2017 from a parasite he contracted as a young boy swimming in Lake Victoria in East Africa. Little did we know 50 years later, it would be the cause of his liver cirrhosis. He didn't drink alcohol. Um, when he passed, we weren't sure if he could be a candidate for organ donation as he was very, very ill with liver cirrhosis. We were guided through the entire process with one legacy and we were able to honor my dad's wishes to share his gift of life. I appear, you, I appear before you virtually to honor my dad and to encourage everyone to be just like him. Each of us can make a difference by joining the millions of Californians like me and my family who have checked yes, who have the pink dot on their driver's license. As Pro Tem Mayor has suggested, you can also register to be an organ donor online at www.donatelife.california.org. On a lighter note, I'd like to also invite everyone to join One Legacy our, for our virtual annual 19th annual Donate Life Run Walk on Saturday, April 24th, 2021. It's a fun event. It's virtual. Uh, you can do it from your backyard or any location you desire. As elected leaders in our community, your participation sets a tone for your constituents. And know it means the world to the Donate Life community and especially to me as a past resident of Glendora. There's also a civic officials team you can join as well. I again, deeply wanna thank you city council members and the beautiful, beautiful city of Glendora for your support for Donate Life Month. Also for allowing me to share my dad's story and the importance of organ donation and protection. Thank you very much, have a great evening and stay safe. Thank you, Yasmina, and, and thank you for being so passionate about uh, encouraging this service that we all should participate in. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, and thank you, Yasmina, for joining us tonight. That takes us now to public hearings. We have one item, the annual action plan for fiscal year 2021-2022 for the Community Development Block Grant Program. And tonight, to I first will open this public hearing and then invite our Housing and Economic Development Manager, Valerie Velasquez, to present the staff report. Valerie? You're on mute, Valerie. All right, let's try that again. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, Council. So tonight is the first of two required public hearings for the Community Development Block Grant. So we'll, we'll go over the funding available as well as the activity plan for the upcoming fiscal year. So next slide, please. So quick overview, the Community Development Block Grant or CDBG was enacted by the Department of Housing and Urban Development in 1974 in order to address affordable housing, anti-poverty efforts and infrastructure development. Uh, the requirements for use of the money is that activity planned must meet one of three national objectives. That is to provide a benefit to low and moderate income persons to eliminate slum and blight, or to meet an urgent community need. Next slide, please. So the um, each year we are required to go ahead and submit an action plan to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We are in that plan to identify the program and the budget. Uh, in addition to meeting one of three national objectives, the activity must also meet a priority need that was established within a five-year consolidated plan. We are currently in the 2018-2023 plan, and the priority and needs and the objectives were determined to be infrastructure and public facilities, economic and human development, fair housing, which is a requirement that we include every year, 
and administration and planning. Next slide, please. So to make it a little easier, we have this map here to show you which areas are determined to be low to moderate income tracks within the city. Um, they are using still the American Community Service, Service American Community Survey of 2015. Um, the areas shaded are the areas in which we can do infrastructure improvements. Um, at least 51% of the households in those areas have been determined to be low to moderate income. Next slide. So as we plan for the next year, we take a look at the funding that we will have available. This year, the or the upcoming year, the annual allocation will be 310,175. In addition, we also have some funding available from prior years of 189,323. So we have a total available to plan for of just under 500,000. Next slide. So the CDBG grant does require that we give notice to the public and we have public participation. So we made notice to the public for a notice of funding availability so that anyone interested can submit an application for programming it was published twice in the paper as well as on our city website. We had the application period open from February 25th through March 4th and we had two applications received. Next slide. So the applications were received were from Fair Housing as well as from Public Works for a street improvement project. So what we have planned for next year for the 500,000 is administration of um, 47,035. That will cover staff time as well as a consultant that we use to go ahead and administer the program and make sure that we comply with all reporting requirements. And then also Fair Housing through the Housing Rights Center for a total of 62,035. And then we have one street project that's inclusive of nine streets. And I'll have a map on the next page. That subtotal for that is 437,463. And I will also add that that is a large project. They are actually anticipating the cost of that project to be about 600,000. So it'll start later in this fiscal year and continue in the next. So you'll likely see that also included in next year's plan as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the area of the street project. It's basically most of the streets between Grand and Glendora and between Juanita and Arrow Highway. There are nine streets included as you can see in this slide and also was included in your report. Next slide, please. So again, uh, public participation is required. So tonight we will be asking council to accept the activity planned and open the 30 day minimum public review period. And uh, that will stand from April 14th through May 24th. The draft action plan has been posted on the city website and we'll also make it available in the community, in the uh, community development department and also in city hall at uh, city clerk and planning counters as well. Next slide. So the required steps include tonight's first public hearing. Then we'll go ahead and have the 30 day review period. And then there will be a second public hearing on May 25th. And then with council's approval, we will submit the application with the annual action plan to HUD. Next slide. So tonight city council is asked to open and conduct the public hearing, accept the activity and projects to be included in the one year action plan for fiscal year 21-22 and commence the required 30 day public review period. And I will add that I have received no comments on this item. And with that, I'll turn it over to council for any questions. Thank you, Valerie. Before I turn it to council, I will open the public comment time and invite members of the public to give any testimony or make any comments and they have three minutes to speak. Madam Deputy City Clerk, do we have anyone wishing to speak at this time? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. At this time, no emails were received related to this item and no requests uh, received through the Zoom meeting as well to give public comment. Okay, thank you. And I will close the public comment time and bring it back to the council for comment. Council Member Alawas. Thank you, Mayor. 
Um, Valerie, I have a question. Could you uh, explain a little bit further on the fair housing? Uh, there's what fifteen thousand dollars there. What is that? What would that be used for? So they primarily go provide five different services for us. And I do have it in my report. They provide fair housing counseling. They'll provide mediation services, um, discrimination, complaint investigations. They do outreach and education and uh, will give some guidance with fair housing legal services as well. Have we uh, have uh, folks availed themselves of that service in the past? We, they have, we have, we determine each year, they probably do around 50 to 60 counseling, and then they reach out to about 1200 with educational uh, outreach. Can you, um, can you explain a little further? There's a section there for blight. What, what's considered as far as blight? What can we spend the, the monies on or the funds on for is it is is a subjective or are there guidelines? So there are some guidelines for what they determine slum and blight to be. Um, basically, we would have to go ahead and complete a study, submit that to HUD for an area that we'd want to determine would be slighted or blighted. Our, um, taking a look at what the requirements are, basically that area we would have to be able to de determine that twenty five percent of the buildings in the area either were exhibiting physical deterioration. Um, there may be abandonment of the properties, maybe high commercial rates or, or I'm sorry, high vacancy rates or high turnover. Uh, there has to be maybe some decline in the values of the properties or some kind of environmental contamination. Um, slums and blight can also be defined as areas that have a high crime rate or maybe uh, the general public infrastructure is deteriorating and we have failures. So those are different areas of what might determine an area to be slum or blighted. We'd have to make that case to HUD to have them accept that area as a defined area. Would that be something that we would do in this process or we'd have to prepare for it ahead of time before we come to council? I would say we'd have to prepare for that. We do need to submit the annual plan to HUD by August. So I don't know if we could gather that information and determine our area to, to meet that threshold. So it would probably take a little more time. So that'd be something possibly for a future to, to look at perhaps. I, I would say we'd have to look into that and see how much a study would cost. And if council wants to move in that direction, we can look into that. Um, also, we had used some of these funds in the past to help out uh, rent uh, for our businesses. I think we only have one that actually was able to, um, to avail themselves of those funds. Uh, if with this no ground, is it a clean sweep if we were to do that again? Uh, or uh, because I know if you had the um, payroll protection, you weren't able to get any of these funds. Have any, has anything changed since then? So the funding that we, we used most recently for businesses was actually part of the CB funds. So that was a special separate allocation from the general CDBG. Uh, we could we did not bring it back in the business assistance program just in general here. Um, it's something that we could relook into, but just in the past, we had a hard time spending the money for, for business assistance just because we had to document that um, jobs were created or retained and they have to meet a low to moderate income threshold as well. Okay, um, uh, another question that I have for you is there is there any way that we can use any of these funds for uh, homeless shelter vouchers uh, and or counseling and, uh, and for health or drug abuse issues? Um, I'll have to, I don't believe that was identified in our priority needs. And so that's something we may want to look into when we start to develop our 2024-2029 um, consolidated plan. That's our needs, but what about the overall architecture of the, how these funds can be spent? Is that something that's, that's we are able to spend in that area? You're talking, so you're talking about housing, housing, homeless services, counseling, things of that nature? Yes, as is right now, I believe we take that out of our general fund for our vouchers. And, uh, but then we, I don't know, I think we will rely on third parties for counseling and other issues. Is there a way that we can uh, put some of that money aside for the housing vouchers and for some mental health um, uh, services that we have in the area that we can do on our own? So I'm, 
Again, I don't believe that's part of our priority needs for this consolidated plan period. That's what I was mentioning. We have to meet both the national objective and it has to be a priority need. So if that's something we wanted to do, we'd have to amend, amend that plan before we would be able to address that and bring it in right now. And, and Councilman, I would just add those, those monies that we're using for housing vouchers are coming from one-time funding, not the general fund. Sure, sure, but it, well, okay. But uh, I was wondering if we can use any of these funds for that purpose. So, um, I, and uh, a last question for you uh, on the rental assistance. Can you, uh, can you let us know how that has come along? We are wrapping it up. Um, we had, I believe it was about 312,000 that we made available. This is again from the special allocation for coronavirus, CDBG coronavirus funds. We have, um, we have spent most of the money or approved it. We probably still have enough for about seven more. We have about 40 some thousand dollars still left to spend. So we have made our way through there, helped close to 50 households thus far. So you've been busy spending money, huh? <laughs> yes, yes, it's taken some time, but people are very appreciative. A um, lot of nice comments of people very thankful for the assistance. All right, thank you, Valerie. That's all, Mayor. Sure. Okay, thank you. Council Member Friedendahl? Yeah, thank you, Valerie, for the report. It's interesting. I went and drove the map of the streets that we're looking at. Good choices, and it's a great way to certainly take some mileage out of our pavement improvement needs that we're going to learn about later on. So a great thing, and it's nice to see that we're able to also offer the opportunities for the family needs and the, the housing development. Appreciate that. Support this and hope it goes through. Thank you. Council Member Thompson. Madam Mayor, thank you. I wanna echo what David said. Great job on this report. Valerie, just one uh, thing. So the 310,000, is that equal to what we got last time? Less than, more than, and can it's, you give some? It's, yeah, some it's contact? slightly. It's slightly more every year. The allocation's just a little bit different, but okay. um, I think last year we were around three hundred and four thousand, somewhere around there. So it's overall very minimally different. It's very similar, but it's a tiny bit more. Yeah, and and is there any way to gauge why it was more? Was it was it the you know, way that we ask for the funds, or is it just a a, a, a mathematical thing that the government a, does? There's a formula that they have when they're putting okay. together their budget, so it has nothing to do with our request or what we're asking them for. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, and excellent work, and I support this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Um, no questions. Great job, Valerie. Appreciate the report. Thank you. Appreciate your report, Valerie, and all the hard work that you do on this on a regular basis. Uh, with that, I will request a motion and a second. So moved. I'll second. Thank you. That's a motion by, I believe it was Alawas. Correct. Yes, and second by Friedendahl. Um, I will take a roll call vote. Council Member Alawas? Yes. Council Member Thompson? Yes. Council Member Friedendahl? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer? Yes. And Mayor Davis? Yes. And that passes 5-0. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. That takes us to the consent calendar, items 8 through 10. The consent calendar can be enacted by one single motion unless there are any items that any council member chooses to uh, remove for discussion. And seeing that no items have been uh, pulled for discussion, I will request a motion. I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Thank you, that is a motion. Council Member Alawas, a second by Council Member Thompson. I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Council Member Alawas? Yes. Council Member Thompson? Yes. Council Member Friedendahl? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer? Yes. And Mayor Davis? Yes. That passes 5-0, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that takes us to uh, member agenda items. Item 11, update on design of the Medal of Merit recognition. 
And I will call upon Community Services Director, John Aguirre to present the staff report. Hello, Mr. Aguirre. Hello, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, here tonight to give you an update on the design of the Medal of Merit Recognition Strategic Plan 30-EMO. Next slide, please. Um, a little background at our 2020 Strategic Plan Workshop. The City Council considered the establishment of the Medal of Merit program aimed to celebrate uh, individual achievement. The Council set up subcommittee made up of Council Member Friedendahl and Thompson to finalize the policy for the Medal of Merit program and referred the design of the Medal of Merit to the Community Services Commission. Next slide, please. At the February 18th, 2021 Community Services Commission meeting, our commission discussed mock-ups and directed staff to bring back additional mock-up designs. Uh, the commission did recommend the award to be metal, two and a half inches in size, um, a neck ribbon utilizing the city colors, green and gold, uh, to be double-faced, front side to have the approved design of the, uh, of the metal, and the backside to be the recipient's name and year uh, all engraved. Also a lapel pin will be presented with the same design uh, when given out the award. Uh, at the March 18th Community Services Commission meeting, uh, the commission discussed and approved the design of the Medal of Merit that will be presented tonight. Next slide, please. This is your uh, Medal of Merit. Um, it has a city seal in the middle, uh, and then the Medal of Merit, and then our three dedicated community and excellence. Um, so this is the approval that came from the uh, Community Services Commission. Next slide, please. Here is a sample of the neck ribbon with the city colors, the green and gold. Next slide, please. Here, here they are uh, next to each other. Next slide, please. And then the policy for the Medal of Merit program. Um, award is presented, is proposed to represent a significant recognition for the recipient, either personal achievement or an appreciation of their dedicated service to the community. Requests will be submitted to the city through the city manager's office for routing to the current mayor and mayor pro tem for consideration and unanimous approval. Uh, the request received will be administered by the office of the city manager's office to ensure historical records on the, on the recognition, including recipient's name and reasoning. Other members of the city council may request the mayor to bestow the Medal of Merit award upon an individual or individual meeting the criteria. Next slide, please. So for tonight, uh, we ask that the City Council approve the Medal of Merit design as submitted by the Community Services Commission, adopt a City Council resolution entitled a resolution adopting the Medal of Merit policy, program, medallion, and lapel pin, and or provide direction to staff. Um, we also have Council Member Friedendahl who attended both commission meetings and uh, City Clerk Kathleen Sessman also is on the call if you have any questions regarding the policy. And this concludes staff report. Thank you, Mr. Aguirre. I'll bring you back to council then for discussion. Uh, council Member Friedendahl. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first, I'd like to extend great gratitude and appreciation for the enthusiasm and the energy that the Community Services Commission embraced this project took it on, had great discussion um, and, and terrific contribution to achieve you know, the desired end. So I appreciate their efforts to that. Um, and thank you for Mr. Aguirre's work to help the whole department get through this. Um, I think we've got a great program and a, a worthy program to recognize our citizens. I, we did have notation that the uh, metal would, I believe, have relief or three-dimensional relief on the face of it with a smooth backing for engraving and recognizing that in 
most opportunities we'll be able to expect to be able to get it engraved with the recipient's name and dates in advance. Sometimes some of the targets for this opportunity don't get learned with a great advanced timing. For example, a, a high school class valedictorian, those usually are not announced with too much notice, but we can always make that little detail work out and make sure the recipient is properly recognized. So I would encourage our acceptance of this. And again, thank all that went into putting this together and let's make it work. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Thompson. Uh, Madam Mayor, thank you. And I want to echo what David just said. I, I, I have nothing more really to add uh, to what he said. I think he expressed it well. I, I uh, appreciate the fact that, Dave, that you know, David and I could work hand in hand on this. And we read several uh, editions of the policy, a procedure and everything. And, and I think that we landed well. And I want to also concur with what he said about uh, John and uh, and um, and all of the people that were involved there, really appreciate the excellent work and time commitment that you gave to make this go. Uh, so I would also uh, say that I support this and uh, hope that uh, that it'll become something very uh, uh, special for a lot of people that I know will be able to earn this. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Alawas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this truly was a team effort from Sonia's office, uh, doing all the research, city clerks. Uh, John, uh, your staff did an amazing job of uh, putting this all together and the community services. Special thanks to uh, Council Member Friedendahl and uh, Thompson for your involvement. I know it kind of uh, put you guys in the middle of it when we started this, but I'm grateful that I did. You guys landed the plane very well, so thank you very much. Um, I have one little question that I have, though, is, is, um, is there a possibility on the back side of this to put Pride of the Foothills? I know the front side was quite busy with a lot of the wording that we had on there, and there's no way you can put that on there. But is there a way that we can, we can put that as an arc or something on the back when we do the private en engraving or the specialized engraving? Kathleen, do you remember what the back has on it? Um, the back was originally going to have the year it was presented and the recipient's name, uh, first and last, or full name, I should say. Uh, the councilman, would your idea to be in the in the font, part of the foothills, sort of along the rim of the back of the metal? Yes, that... absolutely. Uh, originally. Originally it was discussed, but there was a concern that some people's names can get pretty long and we wanted to make sure that the recipient's name was readable. So we didn't want to have to shrink anything too much. Well, I think of what it's two inches or so, two and a half inches in diameter. That's a, that's a lot of real estate in the back there. If we can put it around the, uh, the edge of it, that would be wonderful. Uh, maybe we have this as an option if uh, we can make that happen. If it doesn't look like it'll work, well, that's fine as well. Yeah, maybe we could have them do a, like a mock-up to see what that would actually look like and how much room it would take up. Sure, I'll leave it in your capable hands. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor and Boyer. Um, no comments, I, I love the design, love the idea. Uh, look forward to be able to uh, start presenting these. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions in looking at the staff report for the cost. There was a bit of a, a range there, the, the setup from 90 to 550, and then for each one, uh, 389 to 11. Could you maybe just elaborate on that a little bit? And when and how would it be decided that these would be made and how many would be made and when? So I, just a brief overview, we, we, we took a look at vendors we use for the mayor's tile and other vendors that the city uses for other items, which is how we came up with the range of estimated costs. Uh, we'd probably look at moving forward uh, with the design to get a final mock-up within the next month or so and order, let's say 10 to 25 at first order, looking at the pricing to have them on hand, then doing some of the engraving. Um, Looking at Kathleen, 
here to see if I missed or John to see if I miss any information on that front. Um, and I would just add though, Mayor, uh, if we do get a motion tonight, if we could also incorporate Councilman Elowis's request for part of the foothill potential look at the bottom, whatever motion that is, just to make sure we dot our I's and cross our T's here moving forward. So, um, but that's the reason for the estimated cost range. As a point of reference, that was, uh, that was adopted in 1920, that uh, motto. Yeah, we're just mean because you're adopting the design, which is in the policy this evening. Sure. Thank you. Okay, well, with that, uh, then I'd ask if there is a motion. I would like to so move. Second. Thank you, there's a motion. Oh, yes, Adam. Yeah, can, can, can we get the point of order from the mover to add Councilman Alice's request for the design on the back? Yes, so moved with the amendment to the addition. Could I ask a question about that, Michael? Sure. Um, you, you, your, your thought would be to engrave the back of every one of them. Is, is that what you're thinking? Maybe we can get that as part of the, the, uh, the blank manufacturing of it. So they all have them. And then we just I, simply engrave their name and the date. I, I guess my question would be, we we may be engraving them twice once with the logo and then another time with the name um and that may significantly affect the cost would it be possible to just as we do the engraving add that if um if that's requested either way as long as it's there well and i thought that uh there was a suggestion made for a mock-up or at least to look at it and that Ms. Sussman's uh, comment about it may be too much writing if the person has a long name or some other thing that needs to be put on the back. That's why uh, maybe if there's flexibility to that, as the mayor pro tem says, that when the engraving is done at that time, it could be decided if that will work or not. That may be one way to handle that. Agreed. I guess, does that work, Michael? Yeah, is, yeah, as long as we have the option to put it on there if it fits. Okay, well, in, in that case, I think we could vote on this the way it stands without amending it. Yes, sir. Well, don't they want need direction to be able to put that on if we don't uh, make that as part of the motion? Well, that would be requested at the time of the engraving, I guess, would be my thought rather than having them engraved twice. We can have an administerial change to the policy to add that section if, if upon request it's added in, if it fits. Maybe we can put that language on there as an option upon request. Okay. Do so. Okay, that is a motion. Okay, but I'm not entirely sure oh. what the motion is here. <laughs> Gary had to complicate things, I'm sorry. No, we're, we're gonna- All you gotta do is that make a clear motion. From a staff perspective, we'll take the request for Pride of the Foothills to be on the back as an administerial change to the proposed policy. If available, we'll make sure we add that section. How about that? Perfect. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is the um, Medal of Merit design submitted by Community Services, adopt a resolution entitled Resolution Adopting the Medal of Merit Policy Program. Um, with administrative changes, administrative changes as referenced in the meeting, and to also include uh, an option to include upon request prior to the foothills on the back of the medal. Um, and that was a motion by Friedendahl, I believe, and a second by Councilmember Thompson. I'll take right. a roll, yes, I'll take a roll call vote. Councilmember Alawas? Yes. Councilmember Thompson? Yes. Councilmember Friedendahl? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Boyer? Yes. And Mayor Davis. Yes. And that passes 5-0. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. That... Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Mayor. Sorry about that. I think that I accidentally hit that. All right. Item 12, unfinished business. Update on board's commission's recruitment for terms expiring June 30th, 2021. 
And Deputy City Clerk Elvia Harvey is going to present. Ms. Elvia. Okay, now I'm sure. muted. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, today I'm going to be giving a staff report summary of recruitment efforts for boards and commission terms that are expiring this year, June 30th. Uh, notice of vacancy was published in the city's website and in the San Gabriel Valley Examiner on February 25th, March 4th, and March 11th of 2021, posted to the city website, social media, bulletin boards, and the scrolling marquee in front of City Hall. Um, as of the close of the recruitment period, an insufficient number of applications were received to hold interviews for all vacant seats. Lack of the applicants may be attributed to COVID-19 um, and the use of virtual in-person public meetings, which folks might not be accustomed to. Um, so uh, we did include a summary um, as part of the staff report that tells you what the vacancies were, um, how many applications, but I'll review that with you. For the Board of Library Trustees, we do have two vacancies for that. We received no applications. The uh, Business Improvement District Advisory Board, there are two vacancies, uh, one with an expiring term for somebody who has reached their maximum amount of terms and one with an incumbent. That incumbent has reapplied for um, uh, um, reappointment. Um, and aside from that, no other applications were received. The Planning Commission, uh, we have two vacancies, one um, uh, incumbent applied and one new application was received for the Community Services Commissions. We have three vacancies and we have five applications that were received. For the Water Commission, three vacancies of the current sitting um, Planning Commissioners, all three who are eligible for reappointment applied. Um, due to the lack of applications that were received for the Board of Library Trustees and the Business Improvement District Advisory Boards, um, an extension of the recruitment would be needed. Um, as, an, as, a sufficient, as sufficient applications were received for Community Services Commission and Planning Commission and Water Commission and interviews could be held for a special meeting on Tuesday, April 27th of this year. But since the number of applicants seeking appointment for the Water Commission and Planning Commission is equal to the available seats on the commissions, the council has an option to dispense with the formal balloting procedure and appoint for a, the term of July of 21 through June 30th of 2025, any and or all of the applicants to the Water Commission and Planning Commissions. Um, applications submitted and notice of vacancy was attached uh, to the staff report for the council's consideration. And based on the status of the, uh, based on the current status that was given, the uh, staff is requesting the council give direction on the next steps. There were options that were also included in the staff report, which include the council could direct the city clerk to um, extend the application deadlines to April 29th of this year for all the vacancies. Um, you do have the option also to direct the city clerk to extend applications to the to April 29th only for those boards that were where not enough applications were received to fill the vacancies, which are the Board of Library Trustees and the Business Improvement District Advisory Board, and to conduct interviews for the remaining applicants for Tuesday, May 11th at five o'clock. Um, and also since the number of applicants seeking appointment for water commission and planning commission is equal to the number of available seats. Uh, you can dispense the formal balloting method and appoint for those applicants for water commissions and planning commissions. Uh, or you can schedule for all applicants if you extend that deadline to uh, May 11th. So at this point, yes, Schedule interviews for all current applicants, including the incumbents, uh, at a special meeting, sorry, April, no, it would be for May, or you can provide direction. So you've got quite a few options there that were given to you, and we're hoping to come to you with, um, with those options so that you can give us further direction. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Also, I'd like to mention that Director Sessman is also um, logged on to the meeting and is available to answer questions as well. Got off. Uh, we're waiting for the mayor to be logged back on. At some point, we lost uh, her video transmission. She should be back. Okay. She... Waiting for her to start her video. Yeah, we're going to wait for her video to come back on.
Can you hear me now? Yep. There we go. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. It's not that I didn't like your report. <laughs> But thank you very much for uh, all those options and all that information. I will bring it back to the council for discussion. Council Member Thompson. Madam Mayor, uh, welcome back. And um, thank you for uh, an excellent report. Uh, I don't mean to throw a monkey wrench into this, but I, I think, as a friend of mine said, I think I think that I agree with option two uh, but I would like to uh, extract uh, item B2. So I would uh, be fine appointing the water group because they've all been incumbents, vetted. We know what they're doing. Um, I think they're doing a fine job with planning uh, since Mr. Jones is new and we haven't had a chance to meet him. I. I don't think it would be wise to just uh, go ahead and appoint him. So I would be comfortable with option two, uh, except for uh, item B2. Uh, and that's where I, would, where I would stand. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Friedendahl? Yes, thank you. I concur. Uh, I believe that that the hybrid approach is appropriate. And certainly in the watered world, I would support reappointing the incumbents in the position of the planning commission. I think we should make that introduction interview of the applicant just to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what the applicant and what the council expect. And certainly extend the period for the opportunities that are still open, needing application. I might also ask, uh, you know, we, we've had some discussion about the business improvement district and whether it should continue as a commission or a, maybe a standalone business group self-managed and then reporting back to the city. Perhaps this is a time to look at those opportunities as well once it gets filled or maybe as part of the filling process. Those would be my directions. Thank you. Council Member Alawas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I can also support option uh, two, excluding uh, BII, uh, but I have a question. Um, I know that we have an application that came in after the appropriate hours or time or the date uh, for the library board. Uh, Mr. Stephen Flowers, and so, but it still, I believe, leaves us one vacancy. Is it appropriate to, uh, since most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with Mr. Flowers, can we make that appointment and still have the opening uh, or interviews or accepting applications for the last remaining seat as a point of order? Kathleen, do, I would. I would actually recommend we we received um, we did receive one additional application today um, for the Board of Library Trustees as well as um, an interest by one of the other income uh, uh, applicants for the Planning Commission. So I I would suggest that we extend the terms for the Board of Library Trustees, the bid uh, Planning Commission. Um, as we were recommending and continue to accept applications and then come back and schedule those interviews to happen um, at a special meeting on the 27th so that everybody, if there's anybody else out there that um, wants the opportunity, they can also submit an application because we still have another, um, we, we would still be short applications. All right, well then I can go ahead and uh, support then option two minus BII. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. I'm sorry, Michael, uh, oh. minus BII, I, B2, two. Two. I, I, the double I, right? The double I, yes. Okay. That's I, I, right? Roman, yeah. Roman two. <laughs> doesn't mean, Roman doesn't mean yes, doesn't mean yes, yes Captain. <laughs> it's Roman two. Roman two. Roman two. <laughs> I was like, well. <laughs> <laughs> A um, USC guy always trying to jump in there. <laughs> well, he he made me just step into it, so I did it. You do a good job stepping into it, Mendel. 
I know. As I Mayor Pro Tem. Are you guys done? Yeah, we're done. <laughs> just, just want to make sure. Okay. Hey, um, you know, I, I, I agree that uh, we should probably extend this, but uh, the question I have, um, we've got uh, for the Business Improvement District and for the Planning Commission, we've got incumbents that are reapplying. Um, I personally don't know of any reason that they would not be reappointed. I'm wondering if we could uh, make part of this discussion going ahead and reappointing the incumbents, all of the incumbents that have reapplied and then just dealing with the vacancies. Um, first off, is that appropriate? That might be a legal question for Bill. And secondly, I'm not sure what anybody else thinks about that. I would support so, that, Gary. So, so by so, when when you use the term extending the term, does that mean you're going to reappoint them to a full term, or they're going to continue to serve mm -hmm. until uh, you receive enough applications that you can consider uh, filling those vacancies? I wouldn't call it extending the term. I would call it reappointing commissioners to a full term. Leave it to the attorney to make this more complicated. You know what the hell Billy <laughs> meant. Okay. No, we, would re <laughs> we would reappoint, we would reappoint the incumbents. Um, okay. You can do that. Okay. And uh, anyway, I, I would like to do that because it would just take that off the table. And so we're only dealing with the vacancies and then extending the, um, uh, the application uh, limit for the um, yeah for the application period for the the vacant seats. So are you making a motion, Mayor Pro Tem? Well, I'd like to hear from you first. Um, Any well, other ideas? I, I think that uh, that sounds like a good idea. So go. Okay, for it. I'll I'll make that a motion then to go ahead and reappoint all of the incumbents that have reapplied and extending the time period for applicants to, what was the date, Elvia, April 27th? Uh, it would be 29th, I believe. April 29th. And yes. at that time, we will um, schedule interviews. Second. Okay. So that is a motion by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Boyer and a second by Council Member Thompson to appoint all incumbents that have applied for reappointment to open their to open seats on the boards and commissions. And just for the record, I'd like to read them out uh, for the Business Improvement District. That is Office Number Four, Matthew Klingler. For the Planning Commission, that is Office Number Five, Kirk Norwood. For Water Commission, that is Office Number Three, Ryan Shaw, Office Number Four, John Fields, and Office Number Five, Benjamin Armel. For the remainder, the uh, application deadline will be extended to April 29th, and interviews will be um, scheduled after the close of that. So I will take a roll call vote. Actually, can we can just confer the confirm the interviews will be scheduled for May 11th? That way, we can let um, the applicants know when those interviews will be conducted and put it on the notice. Yeah. Okay. I'll amend my motion to include that. Thank you. So I will take a roll call vote. And the seconder agrees with the amendment oh. to the motion. Yes. I agree. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council member Alawas. Yes. Council member Thompson. Yes. Council member Friedendahl. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Yes. And mayor Davis. Yes. And that passes five, there, five zero. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to item 13, the Metro L, also known as the Gold Line parking design. And tonight I'd like to invite Transportation Manager Stephen Matier to present the staff report. And I know we also have the wonderful Chris Berner on the call as well to answer any questions. So Mr. Matier. Great, thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, good evening, Council. My name is Stephen Matier. I'm the Transportation Manager. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about the first uh, comment design on the parking uh, for the Gold Line Station. Um, next slide, please. So we'll talk a little bit about the station location, uh, the staff comments, as well as the next steps that we have. Um, next slide, please. 
So the station is located and is accessed off of Vermont Avenue, just south of the railroad tracks and Ada Avenue. There are approximately 302 parking spaces, and there is an estimated 1,800 boardings um, in the horizon year of the, of the environmental impact report. So as you can see here, there's a great need to make sure we get it right with access and design for the parking lot. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the parking as it's proposed. Um, we can see in the light shade blue, and I apologize, this was about as big as we could get it on the slide. The light blue is the parking area with approximately 302 spaces. There is a center drive aisle with a, a turning, turning area for vehicles to drop off, as well as for transit vehicles to uh, pick up and drop off passengers. There are established waiting areas, as well as paths to the north entrance, as well as the south entrance, um, which is through a tunnel. And there also is access from Glendora Avenue to the south, and then as well as from Vermont and Nita to the north. Next slide, please. Our comments broke down into three areas. Uh, first one is access, recognizing that the location of the station is somewhat hidden, being behind the townhomes, um, as well as coming up north off of Vermont. We wanted to make sure it was very clear where the entrances are. Uh, currently, there is one metro station pen. These are standard designs on the metro rail system. We'd like to see a second one added on the Vermont Avenue piece to notify uh, either people that are walking, biking, or, or dropping off their car. This is also an entrance. We also wanted to look at the possibility of a left turn get along South Vermont Avenue. We learned from the closure of Glendora Avenue that traffic can get quite backed up as, Glen as Vermont is quite narrow. We want to see if that was an impossibility to help manage some of the traffic flow. We also wanted to see an expanded drop-off area to ensure transit vehicles have sufficient curb space. Um, this is an issue both at the current APU Citrus College Station as well as um, other areas where there's high demand for parking is there are transit vehicles tend to have to fight other cars, uh, be it Uber, Lyft, or people dropping off uh, family members in the morning. So really making sure that we have enough bays for our buses to uh, uh, offload and, up and unload passengers is very important. And um, also too, we want to make sure there were clearly defined walkways and crosswalks to the parking lot. Um, looking at that design, there are, there's probably a high propensity for people to want to rush through to catch the train. So making sure there's clear and safe uh, paths to travel through the parking station, uh, parking lot. Um, next slide, please. Just as important is public safety and, and uh, Glendora PD with Chief Egan and his staff uh, were great. Um, they pointed out that uh, bollards were needed at the two entrances to prevent vehicle intrusions, um, as well as to clarify gate closure protocols, excuse me, and to clarify and really refine more of the station and walking lighting. I also wanted to clarify the responsibility for police reporting as well as maintenance issues. Next slide, please. Lastly is customer experience. And we felt this was important is again, giving, given noted that there are going to be a lot of people not driving to the station. So making sure that waiting and for either um, our buses or the Gold Line um, was comfortable, people knew where they were going. So we wanted to see that there was uh, clearly defined areas for short-term drop-off and waiting. Um, as we know with transit tends to come the mic what are called micro transit. These are your scooters, uh, bike share. We wanna make sure there's a clearly defined area for drop-off. Metro does have an ordinance that they will essentially mirror our policy. So we wanna make sure that we're working with the gold line to design an area that's appropriate so that we don't have scooters and bicycles just dropped um, anywhere um, along the walking paths. Uh, we also want to consider potentially adding a, a rival monument or kiosk in the center. This way, people or, or riders could look at and find real-time arrival information as well as directions. So say someone who's never been to Glendora could get off the train and know exactly where the village is, where the library is, um, or where Route 66 is. Um, there are, these are done at a lot of train stations. I think they're very, very valuable from that perspective. Um, lastly, is consider bus shelters with real-time arrival information. Um, or at least to have more detail on what the bus shelters would look like. Um, next slide, please. In terms of next steps, uh, tonight we'll be soliciting any additional feedback and direction from council. Uh, we'll be meeting with the authority on Thursday, April 15th to go over our comments and to uh, reconcile any issues. Um, and then as, as well, till the project's completed, be working with the authority to deliver the project. Um, next slide, please. So we're asking for two actions tonight is to review and discuss the parking facility proposal, um, as well as our staff comments and to provide any additional comments or directions to staff um, and the Gold Line Authority. And with that, uh, uh, Mr. Berner and I can take any questions you have. 
Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, with that, I'll bring it back to council for discussion. Uh, council member Thompson. Madam Mayor, thank you. And Stephen, thank you for uh, this excellent work. Um, uh, two or three weeks ago, maybe it's been a month ago, Gary invited me to be a part of, of a um, uh, city talk. And we had probably 10 or 15 folks along with uh, Stephen on, you know, on the call. And some of these things were uh, talked about and um, it was a good exchange, um, passionate. And I appreciate the fact that Stephen has heard them and uh, has had uh, been able to incorporate that. Um, I know that Chris and I talk a lot since I've been appointed to the authority board and I'm confident that uh, Chris will be able to uh, hopefully facilitate and work with us on all of these things. I don't want to put words in to his mouth, but he's that kind of guy. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, confident that that'll work. Um, I have uh, been deeply a part of this and involved, and I do concur with everything that is listed here. I uh, know that uh, David, because I brief with him, uh, will probably add a couple more things, which I agree with. Uh, but for right now, um, I uh, you know think it's a good thing, and um, and at the end, I'd uh, like to uh, move that we approve these. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Um, thanks, Mayor. Uh, a, a couple of questions as I look at this: the driveway going into the parking area. It appears as though there's a sidewalk walkway on the south side of that driveway, the southeast side of the driveway, but it doesn't appear there's a, a walkway on the north side. Is that correct? Oh, is, I'm going back to the map. Yeah, to the um, parking mat. Yeah, it's, hard, it's hard to see on there. If you look at the one that's in our agenda packet, it shows a walkway on the south side, but not on the north. That is correct. Okay. It, is there room? Is it possible to put a walkway on both sides? I just, I look at that and think that's one more opportunity if somebody's going to walk in from Vermont um, that, that they may have a need to cross the street, jaywalk across that uh, driveway or something. And I would just think if, if there was room, how much more difficult would it be to put sidewalks or walkways on both sides? Well, the, the room is tight. Um... And we do have a crosswalk at the entrance of, of the driveway, so they could walk to the, the south side and go that way. The reason we have it on the south side is that we're, that is where we want them to go because that is the most direct access to the station through the pedestrian undercross. Okay. And then the, the other question that I had is, um, has there been any consideration or any conversation with the shopping center owner at, at the Albertson Center about having access to that center? Because I can imagine people possibly getting off the train and, and wanting to access that center. Um, there are some restaurants in there. There's a possibility of future development in, in that area where there could be a walkway. Is, is that part of any kind of a plan? It, the future access is part of the Metro first to last mile plan, but that would only be if that property was redeveloped in the future. Right now, the way we have it designed, you, you can't access Albertsons. It's a little bit of a walk. You would have to walk to Glendora and uh, Glendora Avenue and, and come around, but it is accessible uh, from, the, from the station. No. Okay. Okay. Just, those are the two questions I had, but besides that, it, this is starting to come together. It's looking good. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Alawas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, so Stephen, on the suggestions that you have that you just articulated here tonight, uh, how will you, what's the vehicle that you're going to use to get this to go line and ask them to incorporate these ideas? Will it be through our delegate, uh, Councilman Thompson? or will it be directly from a resolution or an action that we take here tonight? Um, based on the action you take here tonight, we will transmit the comments along with the staff comments that we've already sent to the authority. So we're meeting on Thursday to go over the comments that we have. 
And there are no obligations on behalf of Goal Line to do any of these, correct? I'll defer to Chris on that question. That, that is correct. Um, we uh, we are uh, we are not uh, required to comply with your your building uh, requirements or your zoning requirements. However, um, the comments were very good. Um, they were very helpful to us. Um, and um, you know we're going to do our best to uh, implement all of them. We'll we'll discuss it uh, on Thursday. We've already prepared a response uh, to all the comments, and and I think um, staff will see that we're you know we're we're um, you know uh, doing our best to to um, to, to meet those um, you know the, the requests. Okay, and uh, Stephen, can you expand on your expanded drop-off area? We're actually on the map. Are you talking about the expanded drop-off area? Um, so just before the turnaround on the south end where that, that sidewalk kind of goes, I guess, a little bit further south, kind of angles down, um, we would like to see a longer drop-off area or something at least designated for transit. So that's marked as, you know, Glendora transit only. Um, and that's just based on our experience at the APU station, or it's not necessarily as defined as it could be. So we, we have made a modification to that. We have increased the number of spaces from, I uh, can't remember the exact number that we had, but we're up to nine. I think uh, staff requested 10. Um, it's the most we could fit in, in the area that we had. So we, we have, we have um, we've already revised the, the drawing based on that comment. So, uh, Chris, I have a question as far as is there a possibility of of developing a pocket for drop off and or pick up on the east side uh, adjacent to your parking lot, like a little pocket you can drive into? It'd be challenging to do it on the west side of Vermont because then you'd have to take property and I don't think uh, you're willing, uh, no one's going to be doing anything of that nature. Uh, is that a possibility of doing that? Doing it on, on I'm sorry, which, which side of Vermont? On the east side of Vermont, as opposed to going inside the parking lot and going through the roundabout there and dropping somebody off and then coming back out, uh, you know, parking lots can be um, a hazardous place and lots of accidents happen in parking lots. And uh, as opposed to maybe just doing a pocket off of Vermont on the street, you just kind of sneak into drop somebody off or pick somebody up and keep going north. Uh, well, we, we like the roundabout because it, um, it does two things. It allows both north and southbound uh, uh, vehicles on Vermont to turn into the parking facility. And by being dropped off at the uh, roundabout or turnaround area, it allows people to walk to the station without having to cross uh, tracks. Um, going the other direction, you have to cross three tracks. Now we are completely rebuilding it. We're building it to the uh, latest standards. It is safe, but it's always safer to, um, you know, not cross the tracks. And that, that's why we have the, the drop off where we have it. it. It is the, you know, the, the, the optimal location as far as, you know, not having to cross tracks and to um, allow both north and southbound Vermont uh, uh, cars into into the parking lot. Now, actually, I meant in addition to your roundabout. Uh, we could uh -huh. look at we could look at that. It would. Um, uh, we do have currently a, a landscape buffered area um, there. We could look at possibly um, turning that into a, a pull off area. We would you know want to be careful about. <clears throat> backing up uh, into the, the, you know, past the driveway. I don't think that would be a big concern, um, but we can, we can certainly look at that. So you can, you know, in between, yes, in between the driveway and the Little Lilla property, unless you were to take the Little Lilla property, then you have more frontage there you can work with. Um, no plug intended. Um, can, <laughs> can, <laughs> got that. Oh, you're going to have a, you can have a meeting tomorrow. You can add that to it for me. Uh, I, I will be talking with Chris in uh, 14 hours. I, that's, that's true. <laughs> so you're going to twist his arm for me, right? <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> you know, both arms. Michael, so, it could, if I can ask a question. Sure. It, right now on Vermont and the area where the parking lot's going to be, there's street parking allowed. Will street parking still be accessible 
along the, the, the street on the east side of Vermont? You, who are you asking, Chris? Uh, well, probably Stephen. Yeah, I was going to say Stephen. You know, on the plans, it didn't show that changing. I'm not sure if we had a discussion on if that would become a red zone or not. That would, we can look into that. Yeah, because if that were, if, if there was still enough room and we had the parking that could just be designated as five minute drop off parking or, uh, or, or something without making any constructural changes to it. So just an idea I was thinking of looking at the map. Sorry, Mike. That's, that's all right. So Chris, you'll look into that for us. Yeah, I think that's a very good suggestion. Um, we will look at that and see, see if that works if it, and if it's something that the city would want to do. Um, all right. Well, I'm sure we have some time to flush that out. Um, so can you expand? I've uh, been hearing this term called betterment. And the very beginning, I didn't quite understand what was out because it wasn't really explained about uh, my drive to open up uh, the little and little property for visibility and safety to the parking lot and a meetup place as well. Can you explain the betterment process and how much money is in there and how that can possibly be used to, uh, to utilize that property? Uh, well, so a betterment is anything that is ab above and beyond uh, a standard um, that, that the city has or uh, whatever um, uh, you know, third party uh, has um, that the city would want. So. For example, a little and little property is not property that we need. It doesn't, um, it's, it's not necessary for the project. Um, you know, that would, you know, that, so that's not a requirement of the project. Um, there's other, you know, a lot of other different things uh, like that that come up during, during the project. Um, we do have uh, $250,000 or we did uh, budget $250,000 for each corridor city. Um, and we have spent, I can't remember the exact amount, um, maybe, I, I doubt it's this much, but maybe $50,000. So there's maybe $200,000 left for um, better miss that the city would want to, to do on, on the project. Um, that is, you know, that is money that we generally have to resolve conflict um, to sort of help, help keep the project moving is the intent of that but it could be used for other, other things as well. So, so far you only have allocated $200,000 for Glendora for betterment projects? We've, we've only allocated around, and I don't know the exact number uh, off the top of my head. Um, I believe it's around $50,000 that we've allocated of the 250. So I believe we have around $200,000. Don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere in that, in that ballpark. So as time goes on, you might be able to find money left over from other areas. Might be doubtful, but might be available. Yeah, it's pretty doubtful because um, you know we're trying to conserve money for the extension on to to Claremont Montclair. Um, you know, these funds would be for LA County, so it would be for the the, the Claremont segment of, of the project. So that's what we're you know that's, that's our main main focus right now. So originally it was planned to, uh, to have a walkway through the condo complex uh, to the east and now that's been abandoned, it's not happening. There is, I'm sure, a price tag to do that. Does that get credited back to the Glendora? No, that got, that got removed by the California Public Utility Commission um, in, in that they, they didn't remove it, but they uh, did not allow us to, to walk across the tracks uh, on that north side. So and then we, we ended up having the, the pedestrian undercrossing. We could have punched through to the north side, but the walk is longer than uh, going on the uh, sidewalk along Ada um, to, to, the, to the entrance to, to the west there. So it, didn't, it just doesn't make sense to, to, to do that. But that was part of the original design, correct? Way back when, yeah, it was part of, and, and you know, when we did the original planning, the the thought was that we would be able to just walk across the tracks and and easily access the the station. Then it morphed to uh, the tunnel going on both the north and the south side of the tracks. Um, but then we realized it made no sense to do because the um, the walk the the distance. 
and then we ran into the budget issues that we we you know didn't contemplate um, with our estimate for the project. Okay, last question for you it comes from a resident. They want to know if the existing steel bridge on Route 66 for the freight line that that's going to be reconditioned or repainted. That's not our current plan. It is um, going to be left alone a as it is. We aren't changing it in, in any way. Uh, we're essentially not touching that part of the project. And the bridge that's gonna go in there for the light rail, is it gonna mimic what's there currently? No, it's, a, it's an entirely different um, bridge that um, has the very similar, almost the same architectural features as the other two bridges in uh, Glendora, that being Foothill Grand and the, the Lone Hill uh, Bridge. Thank you, Chris. That's all the questions I have, Mayor. Thank you. I was going to say, yeah, this discussion is about the parking. So let's bring it back to that. Uh, Councilmember Friedendahl. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Chris. And thank you, Stephen, for the report. Uh, a few questions. I personally am still struggling with the drop off loop and circle inside the parking lot at the sacrifice of spaces. I somehow have to think that a, a street drop off is, is wiser and sorry, but my 40 years of navigating transportation nationwide with trucks and fleets tells me to avoid parking lots and exposure to people not paying attention in their cars in and out of spaces to reduce risk. So I struggle with that. Um, and I realized slowing down traffic coming south on Vermont to make a left turn is a potential for backup of traffic. So following a, a small company that has all dark brown trucks, they eliminated left turns on their routes and rerouted and redesigned routes many years ago to eliminate left turn. So, okay, we tell our transit folks, you will approach the station from the south drop off to the curb on the right and proceed north. I just offer that as an opportunity to still offer that a kiss and ride, if you will, as a simple call along Vermont Avenue. Uh, a left-hand turn lane in Vermont to turn into the parking lot would be nice, but frankly, using that street frequently and certainly during the closure of Glendora Avenue, the street traffic on that, on a narrow street would not really fit a left-hand turn lane. I'm not sure how we would do that. I have concerns about the reduction of parking and how we prevent overflow parking out onto the neighborhood. We're just saying and we're guessing, well, we shouldn't, that should not be a problem. Uh, I hope you're right. I, I wanna know how we can assure the neighborhood that that will not be a problem. So I, I think those are some big concerns. I, I just today learned what the signal light is at just south of the crossing on Glendora Avenue. So thanks for that enlightenment. It, it helps me a lot. Because I was also exploring, hey, could that be a spot for a kiss and ride? While it'd be a, a logical idea, it's not a smart idea for the uh, exposure of blocking the track with a car pulling over to throw a passenger out to catch a train. It'd be kind of neat because I can just see a big walkway there and crosswalk and a signal light. I wonder how many cars are going to gamble and stop there to let out a passenger. Uh, those are just concerns and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there's, if it's a possibility that the, the property that's on Vermont adjacent to the walkway and it's private property right now, would that be a good drop off spot or a, a transportation drop? I have to think it might be being an island by itself with walls all around it, box vision and most people not see where to go. They're coming in off the street, so offer some confusion. I guess there's some questions in there or some points that we anybody choose to address or? Stephen and Chris, 
First off, would you mind addressing some of the studies we've already done for the off-street parking, the initial round one, and then what, what comes as a follow-up with the residential and business parking? Yeah, we're, we're working on a, a parking management plan um, that uh, we've done an initial uh, study uh, that came up with several recommendations um, to, to implement, uh, to uh, protect any vulnerable parking spaces throughout the city. Um, it is going to be, because there is you know, a significant amount of time between when we did the plan to when we opened the project, there is a, a, a refresh of that. The consultant's gonna come back about a year before the project opens, reassess the area, uh, you know, uh, uh, verify if there's any more uh, vulnerable streets or if things have changed and update their study based on that information. And, um, and then we'll follow those, those recommendations. And so it's the same consultant that has done some work on uh, the previous phase of the goal line. And, um, you know, they've, they've provided that, that information. And we think that that will help protect those those um, those vulnerable parking areas. And I'll add to the the good thing with that plan is we've done a number of the recommendations in there, or at least we have plans for them. So, for example, um, we operate a transit service, which is one of their their key recommendations, as well as first last mile improvements. So, um, I think we're well positioned there. And I think you know, as Chris noted, they'll come back in a year, and we're going to evaluate you know, the existing parking supply where there are potential issues and then, you know, look at mitigation measures. Okay. Council uh, member Friedenau, did you have any other questions or did they answer some of them for you? I'm, I'm taking number, it it while like you're talking. <laughs> wanted the gold line to expand on some of the, the light on light property and the potential turn sort of kiss and ride area in there. If it was a right hand sort of right hand turning only, is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. A northbound traffic approach and drop off. It's also closer to the ramp or the platform, I guess the official designation is. It, it, is, it is a little bit closer, but um, not, not significantly. Um, and, you know, as I, as I said previously, um, you know, the, the, the property is not necessary. It's not, it's not a, a requirement. And um, it would prohibit you to, to only the northbound traffic. And yeah, sure, people do get, can get used to, to doing that. Um, but what it also does is it, um, would have the people walking across uh, the three sets of tracks to get to the entrance, as you can see from that green that green arrow there, um, which is it is safe. The 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 gray crossing is going to be completely rebuilt with the latest pedestrian um, uh, protection that we have. That's very successful on the existing goal line, but uh, the other route. Um, is, is a great separated uh, access to the station. And it's a, it's a little bit safer. And it, the, the walk is not a whole lot, a whole lot longer because the, to access the, the station on the, the west side, you, you, you have to go to the north. You have to go, you have to kind of follow that arrow and go across the three tracks and, and then go to that yellow dot there and then enter the station, the station there. Um, the, the walking distance is, is a little bit shorter, but a not, but not a lot. Yeah. I, and looking at it, just doing some basic measurements from the turnaround circle, it's about equal distance to the way to, to approach where they go to the platform from the, from the tunnel or out to Vermont back around. Pretty similar. It is it similar. Okay. Uh, I'm, so, I'm still not a fan of transit into the parking lot at the sacrifice of spaces. I, mean, I appreciate the, the effort and the energy and the input. I don't know we would pick up a whole lot of spaces. The, um, we, we need the, the, the middle drive aisle um, anyway, so we would have that. We could, we could pick up some, but that area is a, a sort of an odd-shaped um, you know, area there is kind of a triangle, triangle shaped, and 
it's just not very efficient. We could pick up some, um, but I don't, I don't think, uh, you know, a, a large number. Okay, I have no more questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Chris. Um, that question that's been talked about tonight, that property, private property is not of concern to me. I think uh, there'll be a future use for that. And so I don't believe that's uh, necessary for us to uh, become fixated on. I spend a lot of time going to Union Station, picking up college students on buses and trains. And it's surprising if you go there that the little area they have is their version of a turnabout. You'd think, how could this work for a place as bustling as Union Station? But it works. You pull in that parking lot area, you go over to that little sleeve, you wait, you pick up, you get out of there. So this design really can work. And one of the questions I had, Mayor Pro Tem Boyer asked, I was wondering if that would be loading and unloading there on Vermont, because I think that will alleviate some issues because obviously parking will be a question down the road on the street. And rather than making that a red curb, if it could be a limited time drop-off area, I think that would solve a couple of different problems. But I appreciate all the concerns that you have listed in the staff report, Stephen. I think that answers a lot of questions that people have had. So thank you very much for your work on that. And thank you, uh, Council Member Thompson, for your work on this on our behalf and for the meeting that you and Mayor Pro Tem Boyer had to um, air some of the concerns that residents had. So thank you, and I will bring it back to all of you if you have any action that you would like to take on this tonight. I'll move that we approve the recommendations from staff and add that the gold line look into acquiring the little and little property, knowing full well that this is only request, all of this is just a request from the city of Glendora and uh, the gold line doesn't have to act on any of it. I'll second that, but can we look at uh, the eastbound side of Vermont as being that drop off to the mayor's recommendation? That's one of our additional comments. Absolutely. Um, so amended. Well, if, if I could ask a question, I'm not sure. I, I, I think the purpose of tonight was just to have the conversation and, uh, you know, and, and ask some questions and, and give some direction. Are, are we supposed to be taking action on this tonight? The councilman, if I may, or excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem, the yes. goal of tonight was to solidify staff's comments and add any other comments or requests of the city council for this plan. With the full understanding that the last time we came to council in a public fashion uh, to talk about changes and update with the gold line, some of the parking plans uh, were not finalized as presented before you this evening. Um, at that time, council was unable to talk about the specific layout of the parking lot because we didn't have anything to discuss. This evening presents an opportunity, although as Chris Berner indicated, the gold line builds to Metro standard and therefore not beholden to a lot of the city's building codes and provisions, but they would try to work with us on changes re requested. This would actually be the appropriate meeting if council wanted to make a direction or make a formal request uh, as it relates to incorporation of this plan. And this is our chance to have a public commentary on what the parking lot could look like. So question I have, um, something like the uh, uh, parking restrictions or, or drop off point on Vermont Avenue, if there's no additional construction, that's a city decision. That really doesn't affect the the construction authority in any way. It, is that correct? Depending on what we look at the final design, that may absolutely be accurate. Okay. If you wanted to turn it into a, you know, like a, a green curve with five minute 
parking or whatever it is for drop off, whatever that would be. Um, we could do the striping, you know, we could, we could come in and paint the curb, you know, that kind of thing. We could do it for you, but it's your decision what you yeah, want. Yeah, but do. okay. So, so that's not part of what we're doing tonight. Okay. Well, no, I, I like to correct that. If this was for a pocket, that would have to be constructed, not just simply painting the curb. Correct. If if it were if it were for a pocket, then then that would uh, that would take a decision. But if we're just painting the curbs, that's a decision we can make later. Right. But I'm talking about a pocket, and this is part and parcel with the parking associated with the goal line. Remember, we're going to have to live with this for the next hundred plus years. So let's get it right the first time. Well, um, Mr. City Attorney, I know there was a, a motion made. In a second, but um, can an well, alternate? The staff, the staff, the staff recommendation is to review and discuss the proposed parking facilities concept design. So the motion envisions that, and then it allows you to provide additional comments. So the ad additions to the motion would be deemed city comments to the Gold Line Construction Authority in the form of recommendations for the design of the parking facilities. So I think the motion's in order and it's consistent with the scope of the staff report. Uh, what the gold line does with it is a different matter. Yeah, I could support um, affirming the uh, staff recommendations and a few of the other suggestions that came up tonight but I can't affirm uh, making a request for them to purchase additional land. Uh, I think that's beyond the scope of the conversation for tonight. Well, and Madam Mayor, if, if uh, I could just add on to that, I agree with what you just said. And I think we've heard several times, at least I know I have, and Gary has, and Adam has, that um, the goal line does not deem that it's necessary to have the property that is that is being talked about and it seems like uh, we're not hearing that and we don't understand what the pros are actually saying and and uh, and and I and I just don't don't think that we should go there to you know support that so so I so I get that but the motion is on the floor it's been seconded Okay. Um, if you can't support all of the elements of the motion, then you'll vote no when there's a roll call. If I could if make an alternate substitute. Well, I agree with that, Bill, but 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 the point is the subject matter is the <clears throat> parking and design up update. It it's it's not about an acquisition or asking for the goal line to acquire a property that they have clearly said that it's that they don't need. So why are we the, asking the for something of, that we've been told if, not? If, if the perp, well, we can, you know, you can ask for whatever you want. You may not be given what you want. If the purpose of the recommended purchase is to add to parking facilities, I think the motion's perfectly consistent with the staff report. If the purchase of the pro, if the recommended, if the, if the request is that we ask the goal line to purchase a particular piece of property that is entirely unrelated to parking facilities, which is the subject of the agenda item, then I, I would agree that part of the motion would be out of order. Well, I think that that's what 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 Michael is attempting to you know do. It's not going to add one single space for a car to park. So, so I, Council Member Alois, what's the purpose of your additional recommendation to purchase a piece of property? is to do actually both is to add parking spaces and uh, also for a uh, drop off and pick up if it I was we were told that a kiss and ride would not be appropriate okay. so people. so I still think the motion is in order and if you can't support it you'll vote no uh, council member Boyer is about to make a substitute motion so let's see what that is see if it gets seconded and then we can vote on the motions in order okay if I could make a substitute motion to uh, adopt the recommendations of staff and authorize staff to include negotiating with the construction authority based on suggestions made in the conversation tonight. 
that includes okay what? and is this is the city clerk clear as to what those added conversations are can the city clerk articulate what those added elements were as I understand it, it was to look into spaces off of Vermont Avenue to include a five minute parking as part of the design. Any other items? Is that acceptable to the maker of the motion? I'll second that motion. Okay. Let's be, cl so, let's be clear with the motion. Is, it, is that all Gary, just to add a five minute parking spot on Vermont? Well, Yes, that, that's what we've discussed. And Michael, we've had this conversation about the little and little property. I understand your needs for it, but we've never had a discussion about whether it would be in the best interest of the community to purchase that property and include that in the parking um, plan. Because personally, I, I don't like that idea. I think that's a terrible idea. And okay. um, my, my reasoning would be that I like the idea of that continuing to be private property, but that's a whole different discussion. That has nothing right. to do. And that this. was my point was that wasn't part of our discussion for tonight. Well, all that okay. whole area so, there is currently private property that they're going to purchase. They're just not gonna purchase that one piece. Okay, uh, council member Alawas, I'm going to defer to the uh, city attorney to uh, tell us the order in so, which these need to So go. you're gonna vote on the substitute motion first. If the substitute motion passes, the main motion becomes moot. Okay, thank so you. Madam Deputy was, City Clerk. Yes, thank you, um, City Attorney. We have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Boyer, a second by Mayor Davis uh, for a substitute motion to adopt the recommendations of staff and authorize staff to include negotiating with the construction authority based on suggestions made, which include looking into adding a uh, drop off locations off of Vermont Avenue across the street from the parking station. I will take a roll call vote on that. Council member Alawas? No. Council member Thompson? Yes. Uh, Council member Friedendahl? No. Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Boyer? Yes. And Mayor Davis? Yes. And that passes three, two. And the main motion now becomes moot and we're ready to move on to the next agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Matier. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. And that takes us to item 14, new business. Presentation of the citywide pavement study and review of pavement management program. And Principal Civil Engineer Malia Ansari will be here to present the staff report. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening. My name is Malia Ansari. I'm Principal Civil Engineer with Public Works. Tonight, uh, presenting the citywide pavement study and review of pavement management program. So, the purpose, next slide, please. Um, purpose of pavement study, and City of Glendora Street Network is the largest assessed of the city. It has 163.4 center miles of uh, public roadways that include major thoroughfare and local streets. Strategic plan goal to improve, maintain the city infrastructure and facilities is one of the factor to conduct the pavement study. A pavement study is con uh, conducted to identify cities, existing pavement conditions, needs to improve conditions and um, improve the infrastructure. Pavement uh, study is also required to receive funding from Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, Met Authority Metro as a condition to keep receiving the funds. Next slide, please. Um, pavement, uh, existing pavement condition is uh, measured or uh, in 
terms of payment condition index pi that is a measure to um, to determine the payment distress condition the range for pci is between 0 to 100 0 means a payment that is deteriorated and has no useful life uh, behind and 100 means the new payment with the best um, payment condition. In 2015, City conducted a payment management program. And at that time, the PCI was determined at 62.5 overall fair condition. In 2017, that data was transferred to new payment management software and the PCI was determined as 59. That is just at the boundary of fair to poor condition. In 2020, the city council awarded uh, Buckman infrastructure to conduct a payment study. Buckman uh, Infrastructure Group has uh, finished their study and estimated that the existing city pavement uh, index is 65.4. So it shows that the city pavement condition has been improved in past years. Next slide, please. Uh, the, this improvement in the PCI is contributed to the projects that city has done in past three years. Um, uh, the main uh, few of the projects uh, the city did were Auto Center in Emilia Avenue, Lone Hill Avenue, Lorraine Avenue, Ada Avenue, and the alleys Glendora Avenue. All these streets were in real bad condition with a PCI of 20 to 40. So they were in poor to very poor condition. By doing uh, repaving those streets, the PCI improved. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, these uh, are the, no, back, please. Back. These are the major thoroughfares. No. <laughs> Next. Thank you. Uh, these are the major thoroughfares, Lorraine Avenue, Ada Avenue, Lone Hill, Emilia Avenue. Those were repaved in the past years. And they, by repaving these streets, contributed and elevated PCI considerably. Next slide. Uh, the black mark are the local streets. Those were done in past three years and they were also in bad condition and uh, they also helped to uh, increase the PCI. So to evaluate the city's present um, network, City Council awarded the contract for the citywide pavement evaluation update to Buckman Infrastructure Group. Buckman surveyed the whole city street network of 163.5 miles, uh, surveyed the existing condition, and now um, prepared the report and developed a pavement management program. Peter Buckman from Buckman Infrastructure Group is here tonight, and I will request him to present the project um, pavement management program report. Peter, please. And Peter, I think you're on mute. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Malia, I appreciate it. Uh, honorable mayor and city council members, appreciate the opportunity to come in and, and present the findings over our study. Uh, it, there's good news and there's also, also challenges in the next uh, five years that we've identified, uh, but it's a proactive challenge that can be uh, achieved uh, through the modeling that we're seeing. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, like Malia indicated, the, the previous studies in the past was one of the first, obviously the first items that we assessed. We're looking at historical trends and historical practices from the city from the 2015 and 17 studies. 
uh, not only for its findings, but also for its metrics and quality of data and quantity of data. Uh, we were contracted back last summer, and, and as Malia had indicated, we were required to assess 163 miles of known public streets for Glendora, which is ended up being about 30.7 million square feet. Uh, quite a few sections there to manage for the staff. Uh, and as I indicated previously, you're looking at one of the largest valued assets in the city's uh, ownership, about $323 million of total replacement value for the city. So next slide, please. Uh, just general general factors that go into pavement life cycle. We might be discussing this through Q&A today. Uh, when we're looking at distresses, there's obviously uh, 39 different types of distresses that can be found on a pavement section, uh, but a lot of those are load bearing or environmental bearing. So we're looking at traffic volume uh, issues or, you know, regards to pavement quality, uh, weather events. You know, obviously we all know how many potholes pop up after a major weather event. Uh, the type of asphalt that was previously applied, age, overwatering or water runoff uh, from landscaping medians and right of ways, poor soil based compaction issues. And the last one is basically the lack of available funding or preventative maintenance and rehab monies. Uh, so those are some key factors of pavement life. Uh, next slide, please. So the tool for to manage the pavement management system uh, is not just the software. It comes from the team that's behind it. Uh, we, we enjoyed working with staff and, and our staff is certified in pavement management practices. So we get a lot of questions like you might even ask some of these questions later this evening. What's the size of the network? What's its general condition? Uh, what's its condition after we perform study or actually do overlays and slurries? Uh, when do we need to perform work? What's the best time? What's the best ROI that we can achieve? Uh, when do we have to inspect at a minimum through Metro compliance in LA County? We work with about 30 cities in LA County. Uh, so we're very familiar with Metro, uh, but you're looking at a three year minimum to do an annual or to do a triennial report such as this. Uh, and then lo local surveys usually are surveyed for LA cities at a minimum six years, but usually about four or five years. The city is using Street Saver, which is in regards to the state of California, is widely used uh, down in the SoCal area where we're focused on as a firm. Uh, we, we manage about 12 different cities in Street Saver. Uh, the Bay Area up in the Metro, Metro uh, Transportation Commission has over 100 users using Street Saver because of that authority. But uh, I just state, I state those because it's, you have some data and obviously other local agencies that you can benchmark your software findings from and, and move, uh, move ahead. The software is based on Army Corps of Engineers uh, ASTM standard for pavement inspection. Uh, so there's a, a ASTM D6433 that we're all certified in. So next uh, slide, please. So the project basically consists uh, uh, benchmark project tasks, uh, assessing like I indicated, assessing available data, working with your staff to see what has been improved since 2017, conducting the surveys, uh, developing uh, strategies, understanding how you're actually performing is a critical element for pavement management. Uh, my biggest passion is the forecasting modeling. Uh, so I have to understand as a manager uh, how you're operating so we can audit it. I don't like the word audit, but uh, we want to make sure that we understand uh, the previous practices. Uh, in developing those strategies, we work with the Public Works Department and assessing the most uh, uh, frequent engineering bids that were accepted, awarded, contracted, and, and put, on the, uh, put on the ground. So we work with Malia and the staff to identify unit costs for the certain practices the city is utilizing, and then assessed your available budget. So those are the, usually the basic uh, project tasks of a pavement management program. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, over the last several months, we did all uh, assessing, uh, looked at all the streets, uh, developed the unit costs, and looked at the unit costs and the budgets. Uh, with the main goal on the bottom there, to develop a proactive program. Uh, even with some agencies we work with with limited funding that you know might not improve the systems greatly, but we're always looking for the greatest common sense uh, return on investment for an agency. So 
we did that here. Uh, we also assessed your upcoming projects for 2001, 2002 as well, and injected that into our modeling. Uh, next slide, please. So you heard Malia indicate what a PCI range is between zero and 100. Again, this comes from the Army Corps. It's widely accepted throughout the nation and internationally. Uh, but with the pavement condition index for our surveyors, they're looking at three main factors to calculate that value per segment. The distress type, such as alligatoring, rutting, or like a divided slab for PCC. The quantity of that distress or its, its extent. So linear footage, square footage counts and the severity levels. Every distress carries a different severity level. One is not the same as the other. So we're looking at typically low, medium and high severities uh, that uh, will obviously trigger and calculate the PCI. Next slide, please. So just generally, uh, these are uh, next four slides are just general uh, you know, physical images are obviously of what a typical pavement section between 85, 86 and 100 might be. These are sections that have low, very low linear cracking, maybe some low alligator cracking that might be happening that just simply need to be patched or crack sealed. Uh, next slide, please. As the section deteriorates, you'll start to see a surface weathering. This is a good example of a previous slurry seal that's weathering and eroding off of the original asphalt surface. Uh, that's noted in our studies. Uh, the, the PC, the distresses usually start getting into the low and medium levels. Uh, the PCIs drop uh, based upon now the greater extent of distress, not just one localized area. So the PCIs are, you know, like this are usually 60, 85. Next slide, please. Uh, medium, high severity distresses, you know, you know, three eighths of an inch to two inches start occurring, uh, you know, full extent across the section a PCI typically of 30 or 40 to 60. These are typically candidates for uh, milling, grinding, overlaying, uh, and other applications that the city might be utilizing or might be interested in, in applying. So next slide. Now these pictures are not from Glendora, so uh, don't take this one personally. Uh, this, is, this is just something that is uh, a localized blowout. Obviously it was a section that's completely alligatored. Uh, and it's obviously they try to do some patching there or filling, uh, but you're looking at what a section could pot potentially become if, if proper preventative maintenance isn't applied years before or an overlay isn't properly applied after about 15 years of service. So the sections usually generate a PCI of zero to 40. So next slide, please. So the general findings of the report uh, are, are inspections. You're looking at um, this is a total section mile quantity, you know, broken out by uh, rank classification, arterials, locals, and alleys. Uh, you're looking at the, the 163 miles of network. The most, as a manager, I'm an owner of my company, so I'm a working principal. And, and like I said, I'm a passionate about what we do for PMP for our clients. Um, the initial numbers coming in, you see an even distribution on the far right column, about 20, 15, 30 percent type. Uh, averages uh, of total miles. As a manager of PMP, that's initial finding is a little concerning uh, because we want to see, you know, we don't want to see the 67% of the network uh, fair or below. Uh, so the overall PCI, like Malia had indicated, is a 65. Uh, like I say to a lot of our clients, you're going to be in the overlay business for quite a while. Uh, that's no, That's not a problem as long as it's properly funded, and that's why we're here to to share those concerns and recommendations. Um, the system is working, you know, in obviously general purpose, it's working fine, uh, but this is, these findings indicate that we just simply need to, you know, pay attention to our overlay program moving forward and make proactive decisions. So we wanna see a network, a network what's called in the industry that would be in preventative state or a high quality would be a, a, a network in the anywhere between 78 and about 82. Uh, so you, you'll be doing a lot more slurry at that point rather than overlay and you have a good balance. Uh, and we have models that are gonna be shown to get, you know, start getting there for you here in a second. But I just wanna explain what my thought process is and, you know, educate you a little bit in regards to what we see and how to move forward. 
Uh, as you see there on the bottom, the local system is a little worse off than the, the arterial. So when we're doing our funding recommendations, we're looking at how much is coming from the state and county funds, SB1 funds, potential new administration funds with the infrastructure bill. Obviously that's, that's becoming more and more popular. Uh, but then obviously we have to look at how much available funding is for the local system and make sure that the city is aware that it needs to be heavily funded. In this case, in Glendora, it needs to be heavily funded in regards to the overlay program. So these are our general findings. Uh, next slide, please. So we related, before we even surveyed, we linked all your pavement segmentation to the GIS mapping system. So our inspectors were only focused on distress. Uh, they obviously have a logistic where to go. But generally you look at this map, the, the, the conditions of PCI, the you know blue to red are pretty much evenly distributed throughout the network. Uh, that, that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that, but the city does have four maintenance zones or four districts that uh, were linked to each pavement segment. And then we're looking at logistically proactive and proactively scheduling maintenance across this. But this is this graphically, this is what your network will look like. So next slide, please. So again, my passion is really to, you know, understand what you're doing financially, I'll get all this information that I need, and then audit the, the actual program. So the city had indicated that there's projected about $2 million of available revenue citywide per year. So we're looking at a 10-year, five-year, 10 million five-year expenditure. Uh, we run that model first. So then when we, when we draft our report, we start uh, showing these findings to the staff to have better communication of what's going on. The other uh, secondary and, and tertiary report that was done there was what is what will it require per year to maintain the system at 65 until 20, what, 2026? And then what level would it would take you know, to get to 72 in a five, seven, or 10-year program? So we ran all those models, and, and those, those findings are here coming up in a second. So again, we're looking at sustaining the PCI. We're focused on long-term management, alternative payment applications and recommendations we could provide to you, and then reduction of deferred maintenance. So next slide, please. So deferred maintenance is, is if we took all the conditions today, obviously I, we know what the PCI is and that PCI would typically generally trigger a specific type of maintenance, be slurry, overlay, or reconstruction. Each one of those types of work obviously has a typically a 30 cents square foot, $3 a square foot, or in these days, about $10 a square foot. For reconstruction. So applying that, multiplying it towards the square footage, get a city quantity, city quantity. The city's looking at about $60 million in deferred maintenance. So uh, that's normal. It's part of the life cycle process of any network, be it one mile or a hundred miles or a thousand miles. Uh, but it's something that I, as a manager, I simply don't look at PCI results. I look at the deferred maintenance first because I can tell you how that's basically paying off the principal on your credit card. If the network is properly funded annually, you should see a reduction in deferred maintenance. So next slide, please. So this is a general industry standard payment life cycle. It's usually about 25 years for asphalt concrete, about 40 to 50 years for PCC. This is an AC scale. Uh, we, you know, this is basically demonstrating uh, you wanna be able to, you know, provide and fund preventative maintenance on sections that qualify for that and do the work and do not defer it because a section that has 30 cents a square foot and has a PCI of 70 today, in three years I might have a PCI of 58 and needs to be overlaid, which is $3 a square foot. So we wanna address as much of that preventative maintenance as we can up front early and not ignore it, but also pay attention to the, the large amount of overlay that's on the system. So uh, next slide, please. So again, we, we within our re final report, we have a what's called a maintenance strategy uh, assignment table that lists you know detailed payment applications and costs and PCI ranges. But generally you're looking at general repairs, what's called stopgap localized. It can be a patch on a PCI of 20, it could be a patch on a PCI of 90. Uh, those are just general stopgap measures that are needed, uh, crack sealing and, and so forth. 
slurry seals, cape seals, or preventative rejuvenation tools to sustain the asset at a high level of condition for a short term. Uh, overlays are obviously, we know, you know, the mill and grind, grind and overlay type applications, rubber overlays, and other alternative applications for overlay. And those PCI ranges that you see there are, are the general triggers, they're not black and white, but those are the general triggers for maintenance and rehabilitation. And reconstruction is obviously zero to 20 there when we don't wanna to get to that level. So next slide, please. So again, the first uh, model that we ran was a $10 million fiber. Uh, two key factors to pull away uh, from this report is, or this scenario is the PCI reduction of about three points uh, over five years. Now, the difference of looking at Glendora at 65 versus 62, if all of us were out there looking at, we would not physically notice the difference between the two. You, can, you couldn't see the difference there, but this is a trend that we don't wanna sustain. Uh, the deferred maintenance at 60 million drop or actually increases to about 63 million, which means uh, there's slurry seals that are not being addressed and now become overlays. And there's overlays that are not being addressed potentially and becoming reconstructions. So uh, it, the model is showing negative results, which makes me as a manager go to a different level with my client, which is the next slide. So the next question, if you can go to the next slide, the next question is, okay, what annually, will, what will it take to maintain today's conditions until uh, 26? So we see the PCI sustain itself. It's about a one, on average, it's about a $1.1 million increase per year, uh, but we see a reduction in deferred maintenance. That's a good sign. Because if we were to extend this out a little bit longer, we would continue to see even maybe a slight increase in PCI and a greater decrease in deferred maintenance. So this is something that should be used as a benchmark for the city moving forward. Uh, all, all these tables aren't just budget scenarios run through a model. There are spreadsheet recommendations of section by section of what should be considered. Keep in mind, this is a planning tool uh, for your public works department to take our recommendations and then schedule projects proactively. So they might swap out one street for another, but as long as the square footage match and you're staying in, in close use of the planning tool, the model should succeed. So, so again, the next slide here, the, the uh, director and uh, Malia had asked us, to, okay, well, let's try to reach a 72 and what will that cost per year? Now these models were taking the two previous models that included slurry, you saw that in those columns, we focus a little bit more aggressively on overlay and reconstruction here. So there's a really, really minor amount of slurry recommended in these models uh, because I failed to mention there, when you perform an overlay or a reconstruction on a, on a section, the PCI resets to 100. A slurry seal does not do that. If you slurry seal a 70, the PCI, PCI might reach 80. So, uh, we're seeing positive results, pretty proactive, aggressive positive results by looking at how much overlay can be done for these expenditures. Now, I know we're jumping from 10 million over five to potentially, you know, 19 or 20 million, but this is the reality of the system uh, and needs to be uh, monitored. Uh, there's no way around this. These are based, the, the cornerstone of any pavement management project or study or long-term management for everyone on this call is the unit cost. The PCIs are, are just a result of inspection. The unit cost management, trying to get more done with less money is the challenge that Glendora has, uh, but it's achievable as long as it's proactively funded. And that becomes uh, an assessment of how much state, federal, uh, LA County, Prop C, Measure R, Measure M, every one of these funding mechanisms that your staff has available to it, CDBG was mentioned previously in tonight's meeting, those streets would be in the model. Uh, those things need to be obviously proactively assessed by your staff on an annual basis. And then again, the report is recommended to do every three years. And some cities do it every year. Some cities do it every four years, but it's really how the city wants to proactively walk into this program. And, and make it a better program. 
So next slide, please. So again, I, I spoke to a lot about this. Uh, we're looking at, you know, in the overlay model there that you saw at the last slide there and with the three scenarios to reach 72, you know, we're recommending really only addressing about 7% of the slurry that's on the system today and it, focusing heavy on overlay. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as the funding's there. Uh, even at the maintain, PC, the maintain PCI model at $1.1 million increase, which I, you know, the staff report is recommending. Uh, that's the bare minimum the city should do, and it's a proactive step. Uh, at a minimum, you know, like it says, try to reach that 72 in a certain amount of years with heavy overlay. Uh, the city should evaluate the, the entire network proactively every three years, like I've mentioned. Uh, the city's upcoming completion of funded projects should the city should identify long-term preventative maintenance and overlay schedules. We've given the staff the spreadsheets, the fiscal year, what streets by, by fiscal year as a planning recommendation. Those, again, I wanna you know, reiterate that those are planning recommendations that the city can obviously adjust as long as the square footages stay about the same. You know, I'm looking at, you know, I made a note, the city back in, you know, over the last, you know, 17, 18, 19 fiscal years, you're, you're looking at uh, way, way over 1.5 million square feet of improvements on those, on those work histories, probably even greater. So those are the types of things that should be monitored as you move into 2022 and 2023 uh, between major inspections. Uh, and continue to use the software that's available to you. The, the staff has that software available and there's other uh, online web portals that you can view using Street Saver as well. But, you know, generally, uh, you know, we work with cities in LA County that are a lot worse off than Glendora. So let's take that to heart. Uh, the system has been well managed for the, the amount of available funding that's been available to them. Uh, but as a manager, I've been doing this for about 22 years in, in Southern California, focused only on pavement management. Uh, so I've seen a lot of trends and a lot of success programs. Uh, one example, there's a city just east of you. It's a very large city. They were in the low 60s in, in 2002. Uh, we've been working with them for over 25 years. Uh, they're at a level of 84 now, and they are about five times as big as you. So as long as the system is uh, continuously communicated, that's a, the successful of any pavement management program is communication, transparency, honesty, and professionalism. Uh, and so we're, we're excited and blessed to be working with you guys, uh, but those are our general findings. So with that, uh, open it up for any questions, if any. Thank you, Malia, and thank you, Peter. That was uh, great information. And does that city's name uh, rhyme with Ramona? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of our clients. No, it is not that one. It's a little oh. bit up and it's not in the LA County, put it that oh, okay. way. Um, and also, I think that one photo you had on there might have been Lorraine prior to the paving. So I know that uh, that made uh, Mr. Thompson have some longings for <laughs> that street the way it used to be. But no, thank you very much. Uh, I will bring it back to council for comments. Council Member Alawas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question for, thank you again, uh, Malaya and, uh, and Peter for your report. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, Peter, uh, can you explain how you collect the data on the streets? Uh, yeah, like I said, we assessed all the segmentation. We verify that with the, the staff and because we, we want to make sure that there are manageable section lengths and areas. We don't want to have sections. I, I will try not to ramble. I am passionate about what I do. Um, we like to have sections no shorter than about 300 feet, unless it's a cul-de-sac, and no sections that are longer than about a quarter of a mile. Uh, because if I have a section that's a mile long at 80 feet wide, there's no way you can even fund an overlay for it uh, with today's dollars. So segmentation is critical. We use the software in the field on mobile units. We follow the Army Corps of Engineers ASTM standard for pavement evaluation. It's been around since World War II. So uh, it's something that has been injected in the st Street Saver software as well as other softwares that we're certified in. Uh, our staff is certified in inspection through OCTA down south and the MTC up north. So 
you have a qualified staff that's been certified for over 10 years. So our inspections go out, we do a le network level analysis, which means by every section, we, we collect about 20 to 30% of the section's area. It's a random sampling method. It's heavily approved. 99% of all cities in the Southern California use the network level analysis. So we're pulling random samples along a section as long as the conditions are consistent. We have, you know, you have sections that are, you just overlay 500 feet last year, but the next 500 feet is 30 years old. Obviously we would split the section based upon age. So we're, we're looking at numerous things for inspection, but uh, that's how we are pulling samples. Now for a majority of the network in Glendora, it's AC. So we're looking at 20 different distresses, distresses for asphalt concrete from load bearing distresses like alligator cracking or environmental distresses like block cracking, longitudinal cracking and so forth. So, so I guess the question I have is do you, do you actually drive the streets? Yes, initially we'll drive a section then we walk the section. So this is a manual process uh, where our inspectors are for one, and this is a turnkey project for us because we've. this is the first time we've been working with Glendora. So as a manager, I'm, I obviously, we say, get out of the vehicle, re-measure re uh, widths, total, we're validating true areas. Uh, we're making sure all that quantity is correct. You know, we've seen systems in the past where it's just a length times width, that's not accurate. So we're, we're capturing total true area, uh, but yeah, majority of it is a walking survey Technicians are out there in, in dealing with arterials all the way down to alleys. So. But you're not doing 100%, you're doing a sampling, correct? Correct, because those distresses that are shown in that graph where it says type, quantity, severity, once the sampling is established, then the software extrapolates that out to the entire area, assumed area of the section, and then you get a, a, a PCI for that total area. Thank that's why that. consist yeah, that's why consist consistency of distress is critical to the network level analysis. So the next question I have, I'm not sure if Malaya can answer or Adam, you can help direct this. Is um, uh, will we be working on uh, on acquiring or using a GSI system to match up all of our undergrounding with the replacement of the streets, so that we don't tear them up after replacing either you know water or sewer or something of that nature. So Councilman, that's a great question. I'll, I'll take a quick stab at that. So just by way of background, the amounts, the $2 million a year were on averages that were looked at spending. And as we approach the next two-year budget process, we'll take a look at what additional funds can be utilized to sort of meet the requirements and maybe even exceed them as we move forward with funding. In order to do that, obviously, as you mentioned, we'll have to look at commingling uh, water projects that are coming up as well as potentially leveraging various funding sources, including other utility projects like gas or electric that may be going on. Uh, in our budget and in our strategic plan is an assessment of all things software related included in that is the ESRI GIS uh, upgrade to the system to allow us to do this more proactively. However, with Street Saver, we do have some ability to leverage some of this work now. And I would also add that as part of the Water Division of Public Works, they are in need of a pretty significant update on their long-term plan. And that will provide some very specific recommendations as well for street segments that will need to be updated. Okay. Um, also, I noticed the report was um, finished uh, November 16th of last year. And I know that I'm sure you have to time this for our budget that's coming up. What goes after you get the report? Is there quite a bit of work that our staff has to accomplish and do before it comes to us? Uh, is that a question for myself? I'm not sure either Malaya or Adam or, um, or Allison. I know Allison's on the call. She can provide a little background into the back and forth we have with with Peter and his group and in our internal review of what's there as well. Uh, um, as Peter mentioned, this is a planning tool. And as Adam mentioned, we're, we're trying to coordinate, uh, making sure that you know, we don't conflict with underground utilities. Um, it's an ongoing back and forth 
um, looking at the report and I, I do plan on you know, sitting down with staff and looking at these recommendations as they're stated and, and see what, um, you know, hey, we wait, hey, may wait some more hey, than others. Okay. Hey, Allison, I think the councilman's question was more of, oh. he's pointing out the fact that Peter's report says it's November and he's, he's curious why it took so long to come to council. Oh, okay. Um, it was a back and forth of, of um, looking at um, some of the streets. We took some sample, you know, and looked at what they had done and found some changes in it. And, um, you know, that that's all I really have. I mean, I can't, I don't have any other explanation as to why it took this time to get here. Well, I know this is a Herculean task. We have a lot of streets. So I'll combine my next two questions. Do we have a listing of worst to best streets and how do we um, assess which streets to repair first? That's so within our, that, that's within our, if I can, if I can answer, uh, that's within our final report. So we, we have, there's two latter sections of that report that's uh, potentially gonna be filed here. Section three is a pavement, what's called a pavement condition index report which is a PCI bisection. And then the section four is what's called a forecast maintenance re rehabilitation report, which is a shorter list of streets based upon the available budget because we don't have all the budget we need. But we, we've made a planning recommendation to Allison and, and Melina and staff for our recommendations of what streets should potentially be improved. So the city has that as a starting point, like Allison had indicated to review them, adjust schedules based upon other utilities, project schedules, city management decisions, city council's decisions, uh, because obviously everyone should have an input, uh, but as long as the, the guideline of recommendation is followed, in my experience, as long as you follow about 70 to 80% of our recommendations, and that's based upon total square footage that's recommended, and not just street quantity, uh, you, you will succeed through the model. But those are, to answer your question, council member, the, those recommendations are in place. All right, and are they in the report someplace or is something we haven't seen just as yet? Uh, Councilman, you were emailed this afternoon with two different PDF files, including alphabetized and by PCI score. I didn't receive them, I'm sorry. We'll make sure they have those. And, and Peter, you, you mentioned something in your report and being familiar with your company and my former agency, which is about six times larger than this agency and, and further east of us. Oh, okay. Uh, I would add that you did mention something that's really important and that's the square footage. Would you just mind one more time describing the square footage and why it's so important that if we swap out segments or look at you know, potential type of work, why it is that it's the, that it's the, the square footage that's so important in making sure we swap out equals? Yeah, yeah, I definitely will because that, that's, that's, I try to hit that as hard as I can usually when I have the opportunity to speak in this environment because, uh, you know, like I said, Allison and staff have our recommendations. The quantities are there in regards to square footage. And I've seen systems get, unfortunately, politicized or council district uh, in regards to, we have $2 million, but let's spend it on, just for, to answer your question, uh, to, let's just spend 1.5 million of that on one overlay instead of the five that are recommended. And then I've been in council meetings after that fact, after that practice has been done for about three or five years and the city council members that were still there those years prior said, well, why didn't your model succeed? And I said, well, it's a tough thing to answer because I'm, I have to say the square footages weren't the recommended square footages that were there were ignored and truncated down for a different type of project. Now that project might have been a, a needed project. I, there's other issues that cities deal with. I completely understand that. But um, the key is to if the city decides to swap, you know, to defer an overlay of 100,000 square feet for another section or maybe three other sections it is highly recommended that you try to match that square footage through that replacement. Because if you don't, the mod, I mean, you continues to do that five, 10, 20 times, the model starts falling apart. Uh, and then we have a hard time 
creating a variance analysis. If we come back and work with you in 2024 or in the interim, it's hard to do that. So uh, I have found great success with public works departments that take these, these results to heart and don't ignore the need. Uh, and I understand we're, in, we're dealing with COVID and everything else like as a private business owner, as well as a public. So um, I'm just telling you the reality of it. I don't shy away from those types of questions uh, because I've seen systems uh, do that and not succeed and they get worse. And you don't want that in Glendora. So thank you for that. Um, last question, promise. And Adam, this is probably for you. Um, in, the, uh, in the budget itself, in the first part of it, asked for uh, about $3 million uh, increase for the roads. And then the fiscal impact, it goes 3.1 to 3.5. I know this is a receive and file. Are you looking for direction or staff looking for direction from council uh, for budgetary no. numbers moving forward? No, the staff isn't looking for direction here. We're about to have the pretty large budget conversation over the next couple months as we move forward till June for next year, spending plan and updated CIP. In the fiscal impact, that's the number and ranges that would be necessary. And I think as Peter mentioned, uh, 1.1 million is sort of the, their minimum recommendation of additional funding to increase the overall PCI. As we look at those figures and depending on what street segments are available to do pending a review of water and other utility projects that we could commingle, I think that's why we're looking at that range of potential cost um, or total street project costs uh, that would be required to increase the score. So we just wanted to provide a greater range based on what could be coming down the pipeline. So are we gonna see this in our upcoming two year budget discussion? These, this will be uh, prime and front and center of a lot of those discussions. I mean, I think as we've made promises to the community with street improvements and our Measure E program, you know, while we've followed through on many of those, this is also a big attribute there. So just to go on the record, I'm, I, I'm in favor of increasing that to the recommended uh, range. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Friedenthal. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Peter and Malia, for the great report. You know, Peter, it was fun to see your team wandering around, not wandering, they were with purpose, but see them in town and doing their surveys. Uh, the, the great learn here is, yes, the strategic budget plan needs to include this without hesitation, or we'll be at dirt roads at the end of that seven years if we don't get a chance to catch up with it. So. Do appreciate that, and Allison and I know we we look forward to figuring out the, the little lottery of which ones are some of the worst streets and uh, learning what's under them so we can figure out if we can address those. So look for that chapter of the story to come next. Thank you for the report, and uh, certainly look forward to working with it. Thank you, Councilmember Thompson. And a mayor, in light of the time, I'll uh, keep my uh, uh, thoughts short. Uh, I, I do agree with what Michael said there at the end that uh, I, too, uh, would support us uh, landing on the, the amount that Peter shared. And I hope that we can do that uh, with some Measure E funds and uh, all of the other uh, kind of funds that we get. Peter, I, this is kind of a crazy thing to ask, but with electric cars and trucks and the government saying that we're going to be all electric by such and such a you know, year, are electric cars lighter and are they, and, and is there less wear and tear uh, on all of the you know, roads because they don't have uh, oil and, or, or as much oil and they certainly do not do not have gas that often leak and erode the uh, the road. I'm just curious. Uh, I haven't I haven't been asked that question before, but in regards to the weight, you know, the weight of the vehicles. If we're all driving, I think they're called smart cars, right? If you're all driving those two seater smart cars, yeah, the the load bearing distresses would would slowly go away. I think you know, not completely, obviously, but um, yeah, it's, it's really not. We we can actually bring in average daily traffic volumes into the modeling too. City might consider that uh, because of certain, you know, want to prioritize 
certain streets over the others. But um, to answer your question in a different way is I've been, I plan to keep doing this for another 12 years or so. I am concerned as well about gas tax funding. So True. You, know, you guys all use gas tax like everybody else. Uh, so if the, unless there's a creative way to flip that gas tax into an electrical tax, which probably will happen, but that's something that, you know, I'm concerned for my clients because of the redu possible reduction in revenue there. Right. Right. Well, I, I just thought that, you know, we need to think about uh, weight versus wear and tear. And I just, you know, I don't know what cars weigh, but I have to believe that electric is built to weigh less uh, but maybe that's not, you know, true, but just an interesting thought to think about, but what you said is true, true too. So, uh, keep in mind, keep in mind too, the, your street classification, be it a, a six lane arterial, four lane arterial are designed to Caltrans specifications for load. Uh, and when those, the streets are designed for five over eight or six over eight, uh, compared to a residential street, that's three over four in depth. Uh, yeah, those are designed to carry the specific general loads. That's why you don't have semis going down your residential street, right? So, right. I think, I think those things are designed in a way to to capture that issue. Okay. Well, thank you to you, the staff, and uh, anxious for our budget uh, time to start. And uh, let's try to get some of these roads roads fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Um, yeah. Uh, few questions. First off, when we're considering our, our streets that we border our neighboring cities like um, Barranca or Amelia, are we responsible for the entire street? Or are we just responsible for half of it? Does that vary? Does, do we know? Yeah, I'll send it, it varies. Company. Oh, sorry. We have... Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, sometimes we're in charge of the full intersection, sometimes we're not. And I know Malia works very hard with any neighboring cities, um, you know, to determine what is our ours and what is there. And San Dimas works very closely with us. Um, okay, so so that's taken into consideration in these studies. There are city boundaries. It uh, it jog along Emilia Avenue, Branca Avenue, and Arrow Highway. So it depends. Those are set boundaries, and depending upon where the City of Glendora boundary is, we are responsible for that segment of the street. It may be center line, just a sidewalk or the whole street. Okay, I appreciate it. And then <clears throat> I got a question. Um, when you notice on the plans to make improvements going five, seven and 10 years out, I, I'm not seeing, or I'm seeing very, very little improvements on the south end of town, south of the freeway. It, is that because the streets down there are not in as much of a need as the streets in the north? Or I'm just curious as to why that is. As a matter of fact, the maps that we're looking at don't even show the whole south end of town. Uh, I will say that is not uh, exact. Uh, if you had noticed the CDBG project that will be coming next year, the, is in the southwest corner of the city between Glendora and uh, Grand and north of Arrow Highway. And, uh, and yeah, then if you go on fourth and fifth year, you will see a lot of improvements are uh, recommended in the south, south of Freeway 210. Okay, okay. So just the, the ones I'm looking at just don't have all the information on it. Uh, Correct. It is on year. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, if you go year by year on the maps, yeah, there are various years that show pretty significant work at various areas of the city. Okay. And then the question in the estimates of the cost to try to get us to um, uh, PCI of 72, are we looking at today's dollars or are we taking um, uh, inflation into effect? Uh, as we're looking at an estimated cost of $2 million in 2030, are we looking at $2 million of $2,020? Because inflation is going to 
make that much more expensive than what we're talking about if that wasn't considered? We were we were recommended to use a two million dollar uh, annual expenditure. The cost of inflation was applied to the unit cost. It was a three percent cost inflation uh, to account for the cost of in increased payment applications. Oh, okay, so the inflation was taken into consideration. Yes. Okay. And also, also can you know answer your question a little bit further? Contingencies as well. So there's project contingencies that are pushing into those unit costs to account for contract administration, design services, construction inspection services that are typically part of a pavement management project. So generally we recommend about a 30% contingency to inflate those unit costs to try to get close to apples to apples on it. Okay, and then uh, a question to um, Adam, you know, as, as we look at this and you know, the, the major difference in cost in spreading this out over 10 years as opposed to trying to get it done in five. Um, is there an ability to possibly borrow funds uh, to, to finance this to get it done quicker at today's cost? Because there's no way in the world the interest on something like this is going to cost us $5 million. Right. So in we could take a look at their, their revenue bonds, which tend to have a higher rate of return or a rate of an interest rate on them. When the gas tax and other money came out, in fact, one of my prior agencies did do something like that, borrowed against it. Uh, you're paying now, but then you lose some of those revenue sources for paying that, paying back that money later, essentially. You lose the ability to do those projects in five years. Um, we can look at front loading some of the costs. I do agree with you. The more you can spend now offset some of that issue later, especially with the overlay requirements, there's some pretty significant rehabilitation of a lot of streets here. Um, but definitely when we start the budget process and look at that, we can look at capital funds we have and then even revisit potentially part of our reserve policy and looking at setting aside money for additional streets. Although I know June's on the call and probably not happy with me for saying that right now. Um, but it's definitely an option that can be considered as we go through this process. And then w one last financial question. I, I'm pretty sure we've been budgeting in the neighborhood of about $2 million a year. And I've noticed the last four years we haven't been spending that is is that money sitting around somewhere or has that money been allocated elsewhere? So currently, as you recall, when we went through our mid-cycle budget, we had such a backlog of other capital projects, we rolled some of that money into the capital fund sitting in reserve for allocation of future projects. Okay. Obvious question, is there a reason that it hasn't all been used in the last four years? So the honest answer, sometimes uh, we have staffing shortages. Sometimes we don't get the projects designed and bid quick enough. Um, both of those things would have occurred over the previous years. And, and honestly, quite frankly, if you go back, we have projects that have been on the books for years that haven't gotten done. And so part of the focus is we looked at things, for example, in the water division was adding an inspector to try to get projects done quicker. So Allison has been tasked with looking at you know, and working with Malia and trying to figure out, do we need additional outside help to design some of these projects quicker? How do we get them out to bid faster? Because it's not gonna get cheaper if we wait. So we are definitely taking a look at how we deliver these projects as quickly as possible. And then that, that would be my last question is that if we have the staff to be able to try to take on something like this and do it within five years, or is that something that we would have to um, engage outside help and so on? But it sounds like that's already being considered. So uh, those are the questions I have. I appreciate the report, Peter. This is really, really helpful for us to take a look at and, and plan for the future. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. That, that, that's all, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malia. Thank you, Peter. I love all the information. And while the multicolors on the map were pretty, it would be great when all of that is blue, but thank you very much. And with that, I will ask uh, if anyone would like to make a motion to receive and file this report. So moved. I'll second that. 
Uh, thank you. That is a motion by Councilmember Alawas, a second by Councilmember Friedendahl. I'll take a roll call vote. Councilmember Alawas? Yes. Councilmember Thompson? Yes. Councilmember Friedendahl? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer? Yes. And Mayor Davis? Yes. That passes 5 0. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And before we move on to item 15, I will entertain a motion. Uh, from the council to continue past our 1030 curfew. So moved. so moved. Second. Deputy City Clerk. Uh, thank you. That was a motion by Councilmember Alawas, second by Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know that we have to do a roll call vote for that. It's probably yes. late. Probably yes, you do. Uh, thank the, you. The mayor, the mayor could simply say without objection. It's so without weird. objection. Yeah, I think we've done that before. Without objection, then we will continue beyond 1030. Hearing none, very good, thank you. We'll move on to item 15. Consideration of a resolution approving an amendment to the authorized position control listing and amending the classification and compensation plan for the city of Glendora to establish the job classification of assistant city manager. And to report on that, City Manager Adam Raymond. Good evening, everyone. I was really hoping, Mayor, you'd give me a one-minute target to get through this so we can make uh, Well, actually, you can take as long as you want, <laughs> but I'm putting a one-minute cap on each there. of my colleagues. There you go. So uh, this evening, the resolution there, the, the request for me is to add the Assistant City Manager position uh, back into the city's position control. Um, we have not had an assistant city manager since 2011, 2012. The city's had a history of having an assistant city manager position dating back to the 80s. Uh, the longest tenured assistant city manager was in that role for almost 20 years. Uh, the assistant city manager position um, in across cities in California and other cities in the United States is very common. Uh, if you sit in the foothold communities from Duarte, Azusa, Laverne, San Dimas, uh, Laverne and Claremont all have one, at least one. The city of San Dimas had two until this past year when they have one. The request this evening um, is, as we've had conversations with myself and the city council, one of the more common questions I had is, when would we establish the assistant city manager position? So in your packet this evening is a job description and additionally the resolution to add the job and quickly, an overall for me is we adopted the strategic plan. One of the things we looked at was the succession planning. And another thing we looked at was what was being asked. And I can tell you, as I approach three years of being here, as we move forward into and move out of COVID into an environment where we need enhanced community conversation, we need enhanced legislative um, conversation at the state and federal level as we look at addressing special projects such as homelessness and we've just talked about the necessary needs and engaging the community on future water changes. Having that position that provides some high level oversight, um, not even oversight, high, and high level help to not only myself but the other department heads to get some of these projects and strategic planning items across, across the finish line is important. Um, and we have reached that peak. In addition, if I'm out of the office or I'm not here, you would have one person that would be accountable for helping run the city in that absence. Um, the position that when you look at the salary being proposed, uh, we looked at internal equity, uh, something slightly above most of the, the department heads and lower than my position, lower than the, the chief of police position and in line with other cities in the San Gabriel Valley. So uh, overall this position, and we've included an, an excerpt in the staff report, but essentially this is a very high level, high functioning independent thinker position that will be enabled by myself to take on projects and make decisions and carry the water you know, in those areas uh, that we've talked about earlier. And with that, look forward to any questions, Mayor, that you may have or the other council may have. And, Go from there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Raymond. I bring you back to the council for discussion and questions. Council Member Thompson. As Adam said, I think we've talked about this. I fully support the uh, report and the addition of this to our you know team. And 
look forward to uh, seeing the city uh, work e uh, even more efficiently. So I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Alawas. Yes, um, uh, thank you. Uh, Adam, did you say you sent out a job description for this position? I believe it's attached to your agenda item. Yeah, it is. It is? Yep. Um, so to, in the past, when our assistant city managers, were they standalone assistant city managers or were they a cur currently a director that was assuming an extra role? Both. Depending if you go back all the way to the 80s with Keen Wilson, who was here in the 80s, uh, to Colbert Heaton, who had a number of different hats, depending on the year. <laughs> you know, on, on, you know, honestly, and Brenda Fisher was the last one who had more of an administrative services role. If you look at other cities in the San Gabriel Valley in the state of California, some of them have two hats, some of them have one hat, uh, some of them have specific areas of other side, others don't. Uh, you also... And that's it's just sort of the flavor of er, every organization has its own meaning. So are you looking to add this to our next two year budget? The request for you this evening is to add it now. Before our next two year budget? Yes, that is the request in the in the staff report this evening. It's item two under the what's requested. Okay, that's um, that's all the questions I have at the moment. Thank you. Council member Friedendahl. Thank you. Uh, I support this. I certainly enjoy the fact that the person is a champion of all causes and, and reaches out as opposed to having a focused vision on a single point. So that's excellent. Uh, the only question I have on the salary range is, are we confident that we can be competitive to attract the talent we're looking for? Yes, that is something I absolutely believe we have the city of by Hamburg recruiting right now for a similar position as our several other cities. I mean, the fact remains, we're not going to pay what a larger city makes, you know, pays, but in our scale, this will be very competitive. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Only questions ahead. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Um, Adam, a question I spoke to you briefly about it, the, the job description you know, is, is relatively vague. And I'm guessing that um, it, it, it will be very fluid because this position will be, uh, depending on what is needed, may have different responsibilities and then also the possibility of it being somebody with other duties as well. So um, what we're doing tonight is just approving the, moving forward with an assistant city manager the job description could change as we move forward. Is that correct? Yeah, the job okay. description could actually could absolutely change as we move forward. Uh, it's attached to the resolution when we establish the position. So people from an HR standpoint, we know what's expected. That would be the job description that's attached to a, an employment agreement. This position, and I, and I would add Mayor Pro Tem, similar to all the other department heads, would be subject to ratification of the city council as well. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and just to note, this is something that we talked about when we were interviewing you and in, in, in the hiring process. So this has been a conversation that's been going on for a long time, and I think it is something that, that is definitely needed. Thank you. Thank you. No, I would agree. And, you know, we find ourselves in a new normal. And if this last year plus has taught us anything is that the unexpected will happen. And having a job position like this that has that flexibility to help uh, support your work as well as support all of the department directors, I think it is much needed. And so I am supportive of this. Mayor, may I, may I ask one other question, please? Uh, yeah, but your minute's almost up, so make it fast. Well, I cut about <laughs> three other questions out for you. So um, since we're about two and a half months away from our next budget cycle, why would we not wait until that budget cycle to put this in as opposed to reprogramming funds now? The request I have, and I don't even know if we need to reprogram funds depending on the process it takes to, to hire the position. So the request is to move forward immediately so we can begin tackling some of those strategic plan items sooner than later. All right, thank you. Yes, remember we're the government, things do not always move so quickly. <laughs> So you start ahead of when you really want it because it might not happen then. 
but we're also very good at spending money. Well, and I think that we have spent it well and uh, investing in this position is an investment in the city and in our city manager. So I think it's money well spent. So I will ask if there is a motion. I would move that. I'll second it. Uh, thank you. That is a motion by council member Thompson and a second uh, by Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Um, I will take a roll call vote. Council member Alawas. Yes. Council member Thompson. Yes. Council member Friedendahl. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Yes. And Mayor Davis. Yes. And that passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to members and staff uh, closing comments. Council member Friedendahl. None, thank you. Council member Thompson. None, thank you. Council member Alawas. None, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Boyer. Nothing to add, thanks. Okay. Uh, any staff members have anything to add? Mr. City Attorney? Just want to comment on the uh, new look of Council Member Boyer. I like it. <laughs> Very good. Any of the other uh, department directors that are still in the meeting, any comments or announcements? And then I would like to remind us that we are adjourning in the memory of Jerry Bergen. And with that, I adjourn the meeting at 10.